assume that we are live. Uh, before we get into this one, as always, please get involved by liking, sharing, subscribing and commenting. 7,000 listeners joined our fans phone in Twitter space yesterday. And that feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? And, uh, and although I'm not expecting anywhere near that figure tonight, I still find it absolutely mad um, that people enjoy our, our live content this much. So as I say, share away, give it a like, comment, subscriptions are always appreciated. Hello and welcome back to yet another live emergency green and white podcast brought to you by Argyle Life. Ian Foster has been sacked as the head coach of Plymouth Argyle Football Club after 87 days at the helm. Although it was April Fool's, this is no joke. Oh God, that was bad. Um, Not only did we lose a head coach, but a board member and a game of football on the same day. Sort of. Joining on the 5th of January from El Etifak, where he worked as Stephen Gerrard's number two, an unbeaten start saw Foster in the running for manager of the month, but it's been all downhill since then. 17 games saw four wins coming against mighty sides like Sutton United, Cardiff, Swansea and Middlesbrough. Four draws and nine defeats. Fortress, yeah, I know, my eyes, brilliant. Fortress Home Park has waited 474 minutes for a goal. And we believe that's the first time ever the club has lost five straight home games to nil. On the road, there's been some positives. We can't dismiss that euphoria of the first away win at Swansea or the topless man boob jiggles away to Middlesbrough. However, this feels like the best outcome for all involved. Plymouth Argyle stride into the final six games of their relegation battle with renewed confidence in the fan base, or at least we hope. Rotherham on Friday is absolutely massive and we'll be there yet again in our numbers. Um, joining me for the first round, um, there's quite a few people on tonight. I'll just go in clockwise order. Adam, how's things? Uh, yeah, good, thank you. As I said just before, I think I've had a slightly less busy day than yourself. Uh, I've appeared on no media before this. Um, so yeah, pretty quiet on my end, but all is good. I just realised that my microphone wasn't plugged in. Um, so this is going really well. Um, ben, how's things? Yeah, good, thanks, mate. I was hot tub happy yesterday, a little bit more mm. subdued today on reflection, but I think... Um, as we'll probably discuss, it's a, a good move for the club. So definitely feeling uh, more upbeat today than I was at around five o'clock yesterday. Yeah, talking of hot tubs, I was enjoying myself until I was getting pings of, of rumours and and that there was a, a, a statement in, imminent from uh, different in-the-know sources on Twitter and I had to rush out of the jacuzzi and get changed for a pod that didn't happen because the, the club decided to drop the, uh, the announcement at, silly o'clock at night and graham how's things um <clears throat> reflective right decision and i've been busy on pasotti in the meantime um trying to defend decisions like, um, there are one or two who thought it was the wrong decision but surely it was the right decision well that's that's it when, when i messaged you and asked you if you were coming on you said you had a lot to say do you, want to, do you want to go first? Do you want to give us your initial thoughts and feelings? Yeah, I, I, I mean, first of all, I feel really sorry for Simon Hallett and, and Jane. I mean, they went through proper recruitment process. Obviously, we were impressed with Ian Foster at the interview. He started off really well, and then something, hap something happened. I mean, what it was, I don't know. We had a succession of games sort of Saturday Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, they had the terrible weather. And I, I just don't think he was able to get his ideas across to the players. I was alarmed when he, Adam Randall started talking about walkthroughs and <clears throat> other team members in interviews talked about the intensity and the amount of information you've got to get on board. And players just can't <clears throat> do that with match days coming rapidly. And there was... Perhaps there's a loss of confidence, a lack of belief. Something happened in February and it didn't get better and the results didn't get better and it was a slippery slope. But no manager can survive five 
consecutive home game defeats with no goals and virtually no shots on target, no manager, no matter how revered. So it was inevitable. Personally, I think it should have been after the Preston game with the international break to regroup. But, um, but he was very insular. And, and, and I do blame the club for this. He never got a chance to speak to the fans. There was no meet the manager. There was no, the first interview we had with him was a sort of in a darkened room and he looks vaguely sinister. Mm. And there was nothing since. I had no idea what his football philosophy was and no, no idea what he was like as a person. He, all we got was the extended press conferences, which, you know, you're under duress. You're answering questions and difficult questions and that. You're never going to be at your best. Occasionally he smiled and occasionally a bit of humour, but then his demeanour on the touchline, hands in pockets, you know, all the rest of it, it just didn't add up to somebody who was going to inspire the players, let alone the fans, to, to secure our survival in the championship. So it was inevitable. Um, I wish him well, wish him and his family well. They made a big move coming from Saudi to wet and dreary Plymouth, but, um, you know, I'm sure he'll get another job somewhere else, but it won't be as a manager. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with, with what you're saying about that. There just never really felt like any connection. It felt like there was never really any attempt to make a connection. Uh, ben, we've, we've skipped ahead a bit, um, but before we, we get onto the, the crux of the sacking or the dismissal or the departure or whatever you want to call it, um, is there anything specific we need to talk about the, the loss from Bristol City or is that it? Can we just write that off and we just pretend that didn't happen and go again? I think, ironically, um, just, to, I mean, just to mention it briefly, seems as it's not going to continue. Um, it doesn't need too much coverage. But the mm. games against Bristol City and Norwich, in a way, seeing the team, the, 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 the system work to a reasonable degree was actually more of an indictment on the way the team was set up to play than when we were just abjectly horrible because there were times in both those games where we were moving between the lines. We were doing the things that Foster was clearly trying to get us to do. And yet in both games, we really didn't create a lot of chances. And as I sort of said on the previous pod, that the damning indictment is we're expected to score off of an average of three and a half shots on target per game and then keep, keep teams out. And it's just not realistic when your, your squad is in some total, one of the you know the the the, the worst is not the a nice adjective to use but we're certainly not in the most powerful squads in the league that's not a a methodology that's going to work with that with that group of players you're better off to do as kamikaze as it was what schumacher sort of did it's actually more pragmatic to try and score as many as possible and just hope that you happen to be on the right side of the the odd number perhaps than it is realistic to to sort of play the way we were so ironically i think you know the Bristol City game we started well for 20 minutes didn't get any clear-cut opportunities really the opposition manager made adjustments and Ian Foster wasn't able you know, for the entire second half wasn't really able to make any in-game adjustments and showed an inflexibility despite the fact that he had sort of adopted he'd finally you know let go of the back three and adopted a different formation still showed an inability to to respond in-game um, that had been present throughout his tenure, his short tenure. And I think that, you know, when you when you can't, when you have no flexibility either before, between games and during games, you're just not cut out to manage in this league, which is, you know, let's be honest, it's a very competitive, it's one of the top leagues in the world. It's, you know, and we understand the club need to do things differently. But, um, you know, it, it's a, it was always a gamble. Some some people can come in into their first job and prove, them, prove themselves sort of quite, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not, mercurial is not the word I'm looking for, but some people can just can, can land and be prodigious, can't they? And just, you know, take up the reins like they've always been there. And some people it's not going to work for. And just for him, it was too much at one time. And I've got a lot of empathy because it was a very difficult situation. But I think Bristol City, ironically, even though, it, you know, you could say it was one of the better performances, that's a damning indictment when you lose one to nil at home and don't really create much. Yeah, Adam, um, We'll move away from the, the Bristol City game in a minute, but obviously in in the international break, you joined uh, Ben, who's beneath you currently, uh, James and Alberto on, on that Staps deep dive pod. 
um, you know, just forgetting the eye test for a minute or two, a minute or two. Is, are, are there were there any statistical positives from the following two games to suggest that there was any upturn on the horizon, or was it just more of the same? And and for me, not from the Bristol City game for sure. I mean, there was a lot of talk about um, the first twenty minutes being at least a little better, which, to be fair, they were. But as Ben said, that we didn't create any clear cut chances. We didn't. You know, have any reasonable opportunity of putting the ball in there. As far as I could see it, we, we won a few corners, did nothing, and um, let our position get on top in the game again. So, yeah, I mean, looking at it, when we went 1-0 down, we were on, I think, 0.3 XG in the game, which is not is nothing new. That that sort of thing happened throughout Foster's reign. And when you're, you're going in, you're expecting to put oppositions under pressure with those sorts of numbers on a consistent basis. You're just not going to do it. So... I know maybe you could look at the Norwich game and say we did have a few more clear cut chances, but also so did they, and it could very easily have have put the ball in the net um, from a number of their set piece situations before they eventually did twice. So, I mean, there's an argument, I guess, and I'd be keen to. I I don't know if you're watching Alberto and hello if you are, but I'd be keen to see that chart again just to see if there's been any little bit of movement on on, on Foster's Foster's greens and whether they got closer to that line that you know. Would, would perhaps have seen us go go safe. My suspicion is probably not. And um, yeah, regardless, I know we're going to come on to it. And it, it, it's the main main thing here. But a lot of that made the sacking both necessary and inevitable. Yeah, what, what did you make of the sacking then whilst, whilst you're unmuted? I mean, yeah, it's, as I say, and I've said it before, my overriding feeling... Um, possibly surprising is it is, is one of sadness and not at the sacking itself i should say like the sacking itself was completely justified and needed to happen and frankly should have happened a fortnight ago um the the thing for me is that we all really wanted this to work and for a little mm. while it looked like it might that the, you know we were in a situation after schumacher and we'd had five years since since the or, well, it would have been four years then since the appointment of Ryan Lowe and, and, and Schumacher after him, that were objectively an excellent time. And when, when Foster came in, OK, he came in as a little bit of an unknown and he came in and he had those few good performances at the start. And you thought, have we really pulled a rabbit out of the hat here? Are we really going to start on that run again? And it it just didn't happen. I think, Graham, as you said, something changed. Um, what was it? Um, my suspicion is, as with many, that, that he lost the players, which is kind of a sign of of what we've been saying all along that he's not cut out to be a manager and when that happens and when you get the results like this it's it kind of lends its um lends itself to the explanation of what everyone was thinking at the start that we've praised basically gone out and appointed one of neil juicenip's mates and he's come in and has not been good enough now i don't know what's happened behind the scenes with the recruitment process and i think yeah with, with hallett and parkinson involved who we know have made good appointments in the past then, yeah, you know, I, I have every reason to believe that that recruitment process was thorough, but you've got to have a few doubts, particularly the way it's worked out like that. So, you know, I I actually feel like I was more patient on Foster than quite a lot. It took me up until the Preston game before I finally turned and, um, and thought something had to be done. So for me, I'm glad something has been done. It's better late than never, but I'm glad something has been done whilst we're still in the fight. Because had Foster stayed, I imagine the fight would be over very quickly. We may even have nothing to play for on the final day because we're already down. So mm. I'd like to think that won't happen anymore. It's a little bit late, um, but, you know, it's um, it had to be done. I am sad that it's not worked out, but it had to be done. And we've got six games now and a new year after that. And it, it can't be any less exciting than the last couple of months have been. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Gerald's... Um comment there last longer than Liz Trust. We did we did debate in the uh, content chat about whether we should have a Ian Foster versus a lettuce. Um but he he wouldn't have won. Ben, what are your initial thoughts then? Nice easy questions from me tonight. This is nice. Yeah. Um initial thoughts. Uh, when I said on the previous pod I was lucky enough to be on the, the previous that it might even have been if he was if going after this game might have still been considered too late by a lot of the fans. Now, I think the reaction has been generally positive. And I think Rotherham perhaps was, you know, if it had got, if it had lost Rotherham, then that maybe 
there would have been no forgiveness for the board. But I think the mass majority of fans have, fi- have said, thank goodness it needed to happen. At least we have a fighting chance. But I really think this was the last plausible time that the decision could have been made. And, you know, for, for any you know statistical analysis that you want to do, an unprecedented run of form at home of losses like that is the only stat that I don't like being reductive, but that really is the only stat you need to look at. And it's not just our fans. It's not like we're in a, um, an echo chamber here. You know, I was lucky enough to go on a, during the international break, I went on a round table pod um, organized by um, the Wednesday week of, of the, the bottom eight teams in the league. And we all discussed each other's seasons, our predictions for the rest of the season, who would go down, etc. And, out of this, there were six six of us gave predictions, and four of us suggested Argyle would go down. And at that point, we had points and or goal difference advantage on everyone else. And you know, up until that point, up, up until Schumacher left, the worst sort of thing we had to deal with was people saying, "Oh, you were really good, the best team we've played all season. You're lucky to um to have not won, and there's no way you're going down." And then the space of what at that point I think had been twelve games. Argyle are now looking to people like you haven't got a clue. You've completely dropped off a cliff, and we think you're probably more likely to go down than us. And of course, a lot of fans are, are quite pessimistic when when you're stuck in those sort of rot. You can you can imagine sort of Huddersfield fans and and Wednesday fans and Birmingham fans not being particularly enamoured with the way their seasons had gone, and yet we were looking like the likely candidate. So it wasn't just you know I don't think we can be blamed as a fan base for being insular and a bit um, um, precious about sort of the style of football. That we've become accustomed to i think you know it was a real stark um stark drop off visible to to everybody so i think it needed to happen and i think this is probably the very last viable opportunity for it to happen that's not to say all of the problems were of ian foster's own making you know um you know, the lack of backroom staff being available for example if the club had arranged that foster could bring in his staff as and when was there a timetable established because then when when backroom staff were quite clear or assistant coaches were quite clearly parachuted in perhaps <clears> under the <throat> foster and or others involved you know that kind of undermines him there seems to have been quite a few things and, and even the, the the international break could have been an opportunity for the for the manager to have been backed and you could still have sacked him two games later like i, I think some people think that's would, would be almost fraudulent but but if you're a manager and you've you're, you've got a player who's not playing well, and you say, "Look, I've got faith in him. I'm going to keep playing him," and you play him for two games, and he's rubbish in those two games, and then you drop him, it's not considered that you've been lying. You've put your faith in him, and he hasn't rewarded it as you as you wanted him to. You know, I don't think anyone would criticise a manager for doing that. And, and likewise, if the board say, "Look, we're, we're back in Ian Foster in the international break, so we all shut up." Or at least we, we that the sort of the, the drone, the negative drone that was present on social media, etc., or the speculation was at least deadened. They could still have given him just the two games that they've given him, and then said, "Look, we had faith. It wasn't rewarded the way we'd hoped, and thank you and and goodbye." And that wouldn't have come across, you know, as disingenuous. I don't think so. I think that not that he'd been hung out to dry necessarily, but I do think there's some complicity in the problems, and certainly some blame to go around elsewhere in the club than just to sit on the shoulders of, of Ian Foster. I think that um, there's some reputations been damaged around the club. Um, and um, now, you know, people like Neil Juice and it, for example, have an opportunity to literally put their, put their hands to the wheel and, and maybe rescue some of their own personal reputations. But I think of the fans have, you know, I don't think the fans in the club have ever been closer than they were during this summer, the start of this season. Um, and that's very, very different now. I think. Um, not saying that you know the fans have turned or, or that you know that the, the, they don't like the the chairman or the board or the um, the staff. But I think this could be a very pivotal moment in the club's history. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that it's not all on Ian Foster, but one hundred percent, he needed to he needed to go now. But uh, this was literally the last chance saloon. This uh, Bristol City game and. Some, you know, I don't think any of us would have been confident going to Rotherham against a team you match up against the style that Foster was playing and hope to get three points. And it's my personal belief and has been for a long time that if we don't get three points at Rotherham, then I don't think we stay up. So I think this had to be done now. This was the last point it could have been done. And thankfully, as, as harsh as that sounds on 
you know, Ian Foster. It's it's good that it has happened. Yeah, a couple of questions on the board then. Obviously, um, Graham, we touched on it off air. Obviously, Trevor East has decided to step down personal reasons. Um, obviously, the, whatever's you know up. I hope you know he's okay. I hope his family are okay. Um, but it seems that we've lost uh, quite a you know a pivotal um, figure from the board who was very you know had very interesting contacts, very interesting <clears throat> history. I mean, you, you'll know more than than I. Um, but it just feels like a bit of a big loss, that one. Yeah, I mean, he had a contact book that the envy of probably every other director in the country, I would imagine. He, he, he managed to get us on He managed to get us on Sky against Rotherham before he left. Yeah. Just, uh, I mean, just to be clear, he, he did announce it on Thursday before um, Friday. You know, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. There isn't a link between what's no, happening. No, no. Um, and he says for personal reasons, and we've got to respect that. He, it's, you know, it, I know he really enjoyed being part of the club. He made our goal TV what it is. And uh, as you say, got us on Sky probably more times than we would have expected to have got so money in the coffers. But I think he will be a big loss. A wise counsel in the boardroom, seeing it all done it, been at the top table. Um, so, yeah, it's a loss. But, yeah, I just wish him well and I hope the personal circumstances uh, resolve themselves yeah we've got uh, nearly 900 people in now get your comments uh, comments get your questions in the comments we'll start some of those and we'll get round to those uh, in a bit once mine have run out Adam we're talking about the board um, what do you make of the board's decision not to pull the trigger before the international break you know as, as you've already mentioned we, we did that stat steep dive or you did um i sort of listened to it i didn't really understand it um you know you know the writing was basically on the wall nothing changed in those those two games uh this side of the international break how come we didn't pull the trigger then no and it's um it's something that if we get relegated very narrowly, we could perhaps come to regret the fact that we didn't make that move sooner. I had um, the club been able to pull together for these two games in the way that it wasn't able to, you know, it, there's every chance that we would have um, would have been able to pick up a couple of more points. That being said, you know, as much as I would have done that, as much as I I would have been happy to pull the trigger straight before the international break and and either get someone in or get everybody to rally round. Um, whichever coach or director of football was going to take over. I do accept the point um, from Ben that it, there's nothing wrong necessarily with trying to give your appointment the chance to work. And sacking him at this stage is at least a lot better than sacking him after the Rotherham game, which we absolutely do need to win. So it's, yeah, it's it's not what I would have done. And as I've said in a couple of podcasts um, in, in the time since, so coming out of the international break with Ian Foster still in charge is was not the way that I wanted that international break to go. It was the worst thing about my international break, and I got to an England game two hours late because of a crash coach. So, you know, it was not pleasing. But <laughs> we came, we've came, we come out the other side, and it's happened now. And I think that reassures me a bit, because one of the things that made me particularly angry, actually, through the, um, through the way that this had, had been operated, and has certainly calmed me down for now, is the fact that we'd heard absolutely nothing from the board. In, in in the the intervening time and it it made me feel a lot more sorry for foster more than anything because he was forced to be the face of this the face of what was happening no the director of football chief executive chairman up up until yesterday nobody faced the supporters nobody made a statement nobody was forced to take the vitriol it was only ian foster so for nothing to have happened across that international break is the thing that annoyed me the most but as i say I have been reassured now for them to come out and a fairly strong statement, as I say, it wasn't just a couple of lines to say, we've got rid of him. Um, thanks and good luck. It was, you know, we, we, we got a few words from the chairman, which I think were absolutely necessary. And that mm. has encouraged me now that we can rally around here. So with a lot of things, I think it's, again, I'll, I'll come back to the same point that I would have made the move sooner, but I'm just very glad it's better late than never. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of comments um, asking about the Warnock stuff. We will get on to that. Uh, definitely want to ask Graham about that. Obviously, he would have uh, he would have been around the the last time that um, Warnock was in charge. 
Thank you. Yeah, putting it, putting it put, uh, kindly. Uh, ben, obviously, I was around the last time Warnock was here, but I don't remember a lot of it. No, you just dye, you dye your hair, so you get away with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, slander that. I'm, you'll be hearing from my lawyers. Obviously, Adam, Adams mentioned it, mentioned it there. Obviously, the lack of a statement in support and and stuff. Obviously. What do you make, Ben, of the decision not to bring in? Like it, we were so slow to bring in staff. Like if if this was, if Ian Foster was the man, what? Like why were we so slow to support him? Why why, you know, Stoke had just raided our whole backroom team. How come we weren't, you know, putting those measures in place to support him? It's a weird one. There's obvious. Which there's several possibilities, but whichever one, there's an error been made. So the thought could have been that. He had specific targets in mind. He'd identified those to the board and they'd said, we, you know, we'll get those in the summer, perhaps. Or there was a thought that they might be able to get those those targets out of contract. And then that proved not to be possible. Um, but in the first instance, it would have been a case of we think that um, that, sh- that Foster can cope until next season without them. If it was the thought that we can get them out of contract, that was a bit of a daft supposition to make. But either of those ways, I think, either of those decisions or or points of reasoning were flawed. It could have been the thought that, um, you know, we'll be able to come to a consensus over the next few weeks over people and they just could never come to a consensus between the head coach and and maybe the the, the director of football or the rest of the, 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 you know, the, the, the staff involved in those decisions. And, the fact that then staff were parachuted in seemingly over the head of the head coach um, is a damning indictment of that initial decision making process, which whatever it was, we can only speculate until someone comes out and, you know, which I don't think it will ever come out um, what the reasoning behind that was. So we can only speculate, but clearly there was a flaw in it because they were willing to then break whatever plan had been put in place by, by, by doing what they did and making emergency appointments. And there were obviously issues behind the scenes, whether that was raised by the head coach, the, the other staff working behind the scenes or the players. Someone had said or it became apparent to someone that we need some help here for whatever reason. So, um, you know, there's no point getting into conjecture, but I think that clearly was an issue. Do I think the arrival of the staff has made a great difference? I'm Not to my eye. Um which isn't to say they're not doing anything or they haven't been valuable, but um, you know, Neil Jusnip said he was quite keen to get back upstairs and yet remained in the the dugout when staff had arrived, um, which isn't to say that that's anything, you know, he made quite clear that, that Ian Foster had asked him to stay in the dugout and he'd wanted to get back upstairs. We have to take that at face value. But then it seems odd that when staff has arrived to to help Ian Foster, that he remained there. Does that suggest that Foster needed his help? That he, you know, that Foster was maybe more out of his depth than we thought. Does that suggest that Neil Jusnip felt he needed more monitoring than, than, than he, you know, perhaps had wanted, you know, wanted to give him more free reign, but maybe he was struggling and thought he needed to stay there to, to have an influence. I don't know, and, and people will have differing opinions on which of those is appropriate or not. Some will say maybe he does need to stay there and help his, his novice head coach, and some people. Will, you know, there's there's a, a popular narrative, isn't there, that he's a bit too involved in everything, a bit too controlling. I don't particularly have a personal opinion because I don't feel I've got enough facts to to draw a definite conclusion on that situation. But the whole staff, you know, the whole uh, assistant coaching and, and staff situation seems very um, badly managed. I think that's evident by the you know the, the, the emergency measures that were taken um, sort of a few a uh, few weeks in. Um, so whatever the, the causes were, which we can only speculate on, I think there's a lesson there, perhaps, that hopefully, you know, again, we've got um, a, a club dealing with issues they've not dealt with before that they will now learn from. That's not a mistake that will be made again. And that's you know, all you can ask for. Um, sometimes things present, you know, obstacles present themselves. You think you're going to be able to overcome and it doesn't work out. You think, well, I won't leave that to chance next time. So, um, yeah. Uh, it, it, that, that that I think is indicative of, of maybe some flaws in the process, but things can always be refined. And that's, you know, having an opportunity to learn is never a bad thing. That's something that Ian Foster himself said when he came in, having new opportunities or new hurdles to, to overcome is some, is, is something good to, to learn from, because it means you can, you know, you know, you can handle that next time it presents itself. So let's hope that that's not something that we struggle with again. 
Yeah, it feels like a bit of um, inexperience from Foster too. I, I was on LinkedIn the other day. I don't ask me why I've got Derek Adams as a uh, contact after he shot <laughs> me for uh, for another publication, shall we say? Um, he um, he he was recruiting for staff for his team, and he doesn't even have a job. And it was just like, you know, maybe you know, managers have this these gaggle of people they bring with them, don't they? And hopefully, in the summer, either if if we go for the untried and tested, we, we bring them those people in over the summer to support them, or um, you know, we bring in somebody who has that um, cohort with them. Um, Graham, I've already touched on it. Um, Ian Foster's reign eclipses that of player manager Stuart McCall, who only lasted eighty four days. Um, he was replaced by Neil Warnock. Um, are you surprised that wasn't the case again this time? I'm, I'm guessing from your your um, the shrug of your head, you're saying no. Um, well, I mean, Neil Warnock is never shy of getting a free pass into the, the director's box at Argyle, so what, he's what, been there what, a few what, times this season. Um, and actually, I've sat behind him a couple of times when I've ventured over that side of the ground. And um, you've not, and you've not decided to get him on as a guest. No, I. Neil Warnock is was he seventy five, seventy six? He goes nowhere without Ronnie Jepson, who does all the work. Neil does all the talking. Yes, he would have been a mouthpiece. I suspect he would have got a lot of the fans on board and on side. But you just remember, he played at home park, start the season with Huddersfield, and he had a whole pre-season get them organised, and they looked, that didn't look like a championship side to me. They, they were not good. And I think championship is sophisticated tactically. You only have to see what Liam Manning did at half-time to change things. I think he's old school, Six games, yeah, he could could have he could have done something, but he wouldn't have done it without Ronnie Jepson. What would that have done to all of the, the internal workings of the club? And what would it have done to the players and have yet another style of playing that he probably would have imposed? I mean, he's not familiar with playing out of the back. He's more the old school, get it up and play from the top end of the pitch. And that's not us. So I think the decision to run with um, Neil and Nance was the right one. It was the only option. Nobody's going to take the team on for a six-game stretch. Um, and I hope Neil enjoys the rest of the games looking from the director's box. What What was the football like last time he was here? What, was it um, a bit more route one? It was bang it up to Adrian Littlejohn and uh, do the rest. I mean, you know, it was... You know, it wasn't a pretty watch. I mean, it, it's, it's very difficult, different eras, different players. Don't forget where we were in the league at the time. Um, and, you know, it, it's a fantasy to think that football-wise he could impose himself on the team. Yes, he could motivate the, the fans, I'm sure. He could say the right things to the press and it'd be great. But tactical management... In game, I I would worry that he would um, make much of a difference with the players that we've got and the way that we've been playing. Um, so um, I'm sure he was banging on Simon Hallett's door every day, let me in. But um, mm. I, as I say, I think his time has gone. He was he achieved great things at uh, at the time. Got us a. Um, some famous victories, and I mean, I was actually stood next to him when he got sent off in the, um, I think it was the semi-final, when he leaped over the and stood behind the dugout with all the fans. It was right in front of me. I mean, you know, great stuff. It's folklore stuff. You, you stick to him like a magnet, by the sounds of it, Graham. Yeah, but um, <laughs> yeah, it, I think the Aberdeen experience should tell us it's just not possible to change that sort of thing in a short time with no knowledge of the players it's going to be a lot more than shouting from the rooftops to the press i think fair enough um adam obviously similarities with millwall with obviously joe edwards this is basically still going to be a question about firefighters but you know both up and coming coaches from the fa's pathway i know that you like your your england set up uh, you like your southgate football 
Uh, well, enough to go. Yeah, I like his one word. Yeah. Oh, obviously, Millwall opting to return to a former manager. Are you surprised that we haven't done that, of, even after Graham's impassioned rant? Surprised? No. I mean, I I feel like it's um, it's one of those situations where I guess you, you can look at it and say, well, anything's going to be better. And I think, would I have gone for, for Warnock despite everything that I, I completely take on board from Graham? I think for six games... I think I probably would have. But the alternative here is that um, we do have a situation now where it's kind of useful in the sense that it's make or break for Neil Jusnip. Um, he was the man who oversaw the the majority of this recruitment process for the manager. He was the one that oversaw um, what happened in January with the change of style and the players coming in. So I think going back to him and saying, well, Neil, you've made the mess, but we'll, we'll rally around you to get ourselves out of it. I think, yeah, uh, I, I can I can see the, the appeal and I can see the, um, I can see why we go down that route. And I also wonder whether there's a, a financial element at play, not necessarily one that I agree with, but going through the process of um, recruiting a manager and sacking a manager within the space of well, 12 weeks or however long it was, would not have been cheap for the club and neither would bring, bringing in Neil Warnock for a, a, a very small number of games, plus his backroom staff who he has to go everywhere with. So as much as I think that might have been a price worth paying, particularly when you compare it to how much relegation would cost, I can understand why they perhaps go down this route and say, well, not only can we get behind Jusnip, but it'd be cheaper as well. May well be enough. Now, it, this is one of those where in six games time, we're going to look at these comments with the benefit of hindsight. We're, we're never going to know, I guess, with the way that this is going, whether Warnock would have kept us up. He, he may well have done. If we go down, it's one of those comments of saying, well, yeah, he'd have definitely kept us up. If we stay up, I don't think there'll be many more comments the other way saying, oh, he'd have definitely sent us down, but he might have done. We'll just never know. So as I'm saying all of this, again, in the knowledge that I absolutely would have gone for him, and in all honesty, um, I know I may be stealing Joe's point when he comes on a couple of hours later, but I would have done exactly the same thing in December as well. Um, but it's a bit late for that now. Um, but yeah, surprised is possibly not the right, right word. Um, and I was going to say disappointed, but I don't necessarily think that's the right word either. As I say, I'd have done it, but you know, the, the, the route we've gone down is at least explainable and I'm willing to support it for six games at least. Yeah, um, Ben... Obviously, Foster and Edwards, their spells. Obviously, Ed, sorry, Edwards' spell at the Den. Uh, does that prove that swanning around St George's Park, coaching England's kids, doesn't set you up for the rigors of Championship football very well? Possibly. I and mean, Rob Edwards seems to have done pretty well. I think ultimately it comes down. To, like, coaching is not. I've seen a sort of few tweets from outside observers saying, you know, Foster's obviously a great coach. And it's just not worked out. But there's more to being a coach than understanding football philosophy, even in terms of coaching players. You know, there's there's famous examples from American sport where college sports are enormous, where you sort of t teach the coach the cream of sort of like the athletic world before they go on to the professional leagues, where guys who are brilliant coaches in college are awful in the big leagues because you're dealing with men rather than boys and you don't have the same... You know, it's it's like the same people say, don't they? they always talk to me? Oh, yeah, you know, football's played on grass, not on paper. You and your stats. It's like I totally get that. Football is not all about. If it was all about, you know, matching up against oppositions on 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 paper. If it was if it was a get a computer game, we wouldn't bother playing the games on 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 the grass. There's a lot more to it. There's psychology. There's mentality. There's attitude. Um, and as you know, Ian Foster, for all I know, has an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, of football. But that's very different to being a leader of men, to being able to con command a dressing room, to be able to communicate. I mean, it's press conferences. I'm, I'll let other people get onto that, you know, later in the show, possibly. But you know, he seemed combative, unnecessarily um, dismissive of of the journalists where, in press conferences. Never really tried to reach out to the fans, build a rapport. Um, you know, all of that is part of being a manager and a head coach. So, you know, he he, what he was doing and the roles he's been fulfilling had no guarantee of developing into or, or, or sort of like 
metamorphosizing as it were like it was naturally going to occur that once he got into this position those things would all click into place and happen that's just not the way it works the same way you've got as, as graham was describing people like warnock maybe who are great motivators of men motivators of men rather but not necessarily hands-on and, and and into the the all the details that's dealt with by other people so um i don't doubt that he has abilities but yeah just not uh, that doesn't automatically translate and that's why i say it was a risk it could have happened it could have come off all right um but just just being just having an education is very different to having experience isn't it we know that in any market there's always the uh, the balance to be had between both of those things and you know he had the experience to a degree but not not in head coaching not as being the, the number one and yeah you know that that uh, you know, even going back to the communication thing, I think if we'd got the fans on side early doors, we'd probably still be in this situation with an off, an infinitely larger amount of goodwill. People would have said, "Really sorry, Ian, it's just not worked. Nothing personal." But but the fact he sort of seems people have felt he's mugged them off repeatedly with excuses, with well, you know, you've got to respect people, and you've not played teams like this for very long, have you? All of those sort of comments, you know, that's that's key basic 101 head coach skills isn't it you know that, that that's and and if you haven't got that then you know i'm not going to say anyone who's come through the your question was about you know does putting out cones at st george's park make you make you a, a good a good head coach it you know, the, rob rob you know, all, all these different coaches that have come through and either succeeded or not it's not about their education it's about those other key skills that they've developed um, it's, you know, Ian Foster's undoubtedly a good coach. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been getting the work he's been getting in terms of, you know, those, those skills. But there's a, so many more skills he hasn't demonstrated that are necessary to be a head coach or a manager, of a, especially of a professional team in a top league like the Championship. Yeah, just moving on to some of the, the comments or the questions, sorry, that we're getting in the comments. Um, obviously, there's a lot on the on the plans. Um, are, are your thoughts to on words? Graham, what are your thoughts on the plans to replace Foster with um, Neil Jusnip and, and Kevin Nanskiville? Obviously, there are four games for them last time, zero wins but three draws, nine goals. Are you, are you happy enough? And uh, you forgot about Simon Ireland as well and uh, the goalkeeper. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So there are four still there. Um, I don't think there was any other option mm. with six games to go throwing as i said throwing in somebody like warnock with a gamble but it would have been a disruptive one um the you know i go back to the one argyle theme that shuey sort of cultivated so successfully and got the fans on board and something that ian foster singularly ignored i mean i just didn't understand why he never reached out to fans i, I mean i was told there was a hospitality event, the club breakfast, where I think it was Jimmy Dickinson and Sam Morgan were due to speak. And for some inexplicable reason, Ian Foster pulled them just before they're about to speak. So you've got all the sponsors of the club there. And then he, he breezes past the window of the hospitality without even looking in. You think, hang on a minute, you're the head person of the club. The least you could do is pop in and thank the sponsors for what they've done, all the support. And just imagine you've, you've shelled out thousands of pounds of the club and then you see him just walking past, not even acknowledging you. And I think that, when I found that out, I thought, there's something wrong here. This insular approach, if it doesn't win over the fans, how's it going to win over the players? And, and um, going back to the England setup. I think we forgot that Ian Foster was uh, assistant manager to Paul Cook at Portsmouth when we were in the playoff run against him. He was on, on the sidelines when uh, Hartley scored that winning goal. But that's the nearest he's got that I can see to competitive league football. And there's a big difference when you, you've you got seasoned pros who suss you out straight away. They, they would know within a few training sessions of whether the guy's got it or not. And then when you're not communicating with players, when you're not telling them why not, not in the squad, you haven't got time to speak to them. 
that's not conducive to a team ethic that's going to keep you up. Something went desperately wrong. He got more within himself. And and England under 20s, don't forget that's tournament football. You've got the players there for a relative shoot, short space of time. And of course, you're older than them. The kids are looking up to you. Seasoned pros have been around a bit. They're looking at you. They want leadership. They want clarity. They want belief. And I just don't think they got in the end. They didn't get it. And it was showing. Yeah, we're nearly at that point where we're gonna we're gonna switch you out. Is, is there anything you guys want to cover specifically that you, you've got on your on your chest before I or shall I just keep going through these questions? I'm sure the other lads will have plenty of their own opinions to share. So let's let's field some more questions on yeah, their behalf I mean, and let them yeah, rant and rave. There's a very talkative uh, section coming up uh, soon. Um, let's pick one at random. Um, I had one ready, and then Joe private messaged me. Um, Adam, genuine question. What do you think Foster wishes he did differently? I don't think he's the type to reminisce or to live to regret. But what was his biggest mistake in your eyes? I mean, I think I think Graham's touched on that. Oh, plenty, well, plenty. But... Yeah, I think um, the, the way that he handled... Um the media both in, in in front of the camera and as i say in, in terms of the supporters and sponsors was uh not befitting of someone who's in a leadership position at a football club in all honesty he's um there there was just no reason i know it, it's ground we've covered but it's worth covering again there was just no reason for him to be quite as prickly in his press conferences as he was because what what did it gain he, he's going into a show, he's, he's put, pitting himself against supporters who, in my eyes, for the, the first few few weeks of his, his tenure, gave him more than a decent enough break for somebody who, as I think we've said, his biggest achievement so far is laying out cones at St. James's Park and for Stephen Gerrard in Saudi Arabia. You know, it, we we were more than willing to give him a chance based on the, on the way that he... Um, based on the lack of experience that he had. And I think that's possibly a bit of faith in us in, in the Argyle board who had made some excellent leadership decisions up to that point. If I'm in Ian Foster's shoes, the last thing I want to do um, when my credentials start being questioned like that is, is start to start to fight and make things worse. There's Because there, there's nothing to be gained from it. And there was nothing to be gained from it. It just helped it make, make it a bit more toxic quickly. And... There's no doubt that would have fed into the players as well. The the way that his um, communication methods alienated us. Now, imagine if you're having to work with him every day as, as he tried to get methods across that you already knew weren't working. So for me, it, it goes back to the big thing. I have no doubts as to some of Ian Foster's coaching skills. I think we've we've all been across that. There's He's obviously got some talent because he, he, he's got some jobs and he's obviously come out of interviews very well. But he's got an awful lot of work to do on his managerial skills. And if I'm in Ian Foster's shoes now and I am in a reflective mood, which would make a change, I'd be looking at it and saying, right, those are the skills I have to work on now. I need to go away. I need to work on my media handling. I need to work on my interpersonal skills. And if I'm going to be tactical and, and something like that, I need to work on my substitutions as well. But that's a, another issue entirely. You know, he's we may well see him back in, in a managerial position again, although I wouldn't bank on it because I don't think there's a single club in the championship that would swap their manager for Ian Foster right now. But if we are to see him back in a managerial position at any club in the country, he those are the skills that he needs to be improved on first. Because if he walks into an interview uh, at this stage after the experience he's had, he's not going to be able to call on the, the relative success he's had um, at England youth level anymore. The first question is going to be asked by prospective owners, chairman, director of football, what have you, is going to be, what went wrong at Plymouth Argyle? And he better have a good answer to that because if he starts fighting back all of that, he's not got a hope of getting another job. So, yeah, that, I, I know it's been covered in, in excellent detail by, by by everyone that's been on on today, but that is the thing that, the main thing that he needs to change in amongst quite a bit. Yeah, I think when I said in my intro that, you know, it's that it feels like the right decision for everyone, I feel like he can walk into another job and just say, you know, I wasn't given the time. I didn't have the time to turn it around. You know, second lowest or lowest budget in the league. You know, there are excuses that could be made there. 
Um, so I, I sort of expect to see him back, maybe not soon, but at some point, I, I feel like he might have. He, he obviously worked the uh, the job interview of us pretty well. I'm basically just going to scattergun different uh, questions here. Uh, ben, obviously with, with Neil and Nance back, do you, do you think we're at least likely to see a return of that attacking football that, that we as a fan base seem to crave? I don't think we have much of a of a choice because our best players are are attacking players. That's not a knock on, you know. I I think Gibson Galloway are easily championship level defenders, um, and there's a smattering of quality throughout the the squad. Cooper Hazard, you can argue, easily championship quality. Not that they can both play together. Mumba, I think, um, is a very competent um, championship level player, and you know, there's others that might be with a bit of time. For sure, clearly is if he's able to be on the pitch regularly, and if he's motivated um now but our best two players i think um are, are morgan whitaker and and ryan hardy really in terms of what they've achieved this season as good as um as gibson and galloway are we haven't kept a lot of clean sheets we have put the ball in the back of the net an awful lot and that's not to say that that's that binary view is how to measure how good players have been in, in you know that doesn't just doesn't work that way but i think that's where we got results that's where we got um success was by doing that and it, i think that as schumacher i think did quite pragmatically you have to make the best of the best players you have yes we've lost now azaz and so um that puts the the creative onus on on other players but i don't think that players like adam randall um jordan houghton adam for are completely devoid of that ability and i think as has been proved um by our, our fullbacks, they're capable of producing an assist here and there over the last few weeks, despite um, as as awful as we've been in attacking output. So there is ability there to 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 get goals, and that's what we need to do. Because ultimately, the more goals we score, the more likely we are to win games. We've proved that we're not great at keeping clean sheets. So trying to somehow, you know, um, keep this th this theory that that Foster was playing of. Of, you know, limiting chances. I'm not saying we should be kamikaze in quite the same way that Schumacher was because we don't have the creative abilities that we did. You know, Kane Kessler Hayden, I believe, is the loss that a lot of people aren't um, crediting quite as much as they should. But we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a Finn ass to come up with with string pulling and control. But there does need to be an improvement on what we've been doing recently. Um, we need to get behind defensive lines where we've been playing in front of them. Um, and trying to hit balls over the top rather than playing through them. Um, I still see a comment there about Dan Scar returning. I think if we're going to play a back three, which Juice Nip did um, when we converted from Schumacher's back four, when, when Schumacher left, then I do think Dan Scar has a good role to play. He has many limitations, but he, if you look at the plenty of games this season where I think there's more games this season where he's put his body on the line, headed everything away, the proverbial brick, etc. Uh, like Watford, etc. Than there are where he's been culpable for a goal, and he has been culpable for a goal or two. Um, and I think possibly some of that was just down to tiredness, as we were getting into the real churn of the season. He's not been playing for a while. I think he could really um, have a big role to play in the last six games if he can come back in the middle of a three. Matt, uh, Matt Phillips seems to have lost his head a little bit at times in recent games. I wonder if he can come back in the back three. Plague was there on the other side. And either Gibson or Galloway. I know you want to play both of those at the same time, and it's annoying that they both their best position is both the left side of that. But I just wonder if Scar might be sort of a rock you can uh, tie your tie your flag to. That said, I wouldn't complain if Gibson was um, was um, you know was chosen over him in the centre of that sort of setup. But I think an experienced back three, um, Dan Scar with a point to prove and and a real hopefully a vein of fitness given that he's had such a rest could could be um um could be pivotal uh, and a few you know a few other i think joe edwards getting a couple of games you know i keep saying that he's not championship standard but i don't see too many mistakes in his games either to be honest i don't sometimes know what i see as other people um other people watch I'm not saying he necessarily comes out with and i know aaron you're not his biggest fan um and he's not always going to you know produce moments of magic but he will also be a pretty steady eddie um so there's there's a mix there's i'm sure there's a balance to be found in the squad um that's that's there that you know hopefully now we'll have a fire lit under it and um be able to um to to to, to be able to express themselves in a, in a forward thinking way because i think that 
the handbrake's been on for far too long now. Uh, you just hope they haven't forgot how to to do it. And we've seen, you know, we've sort of seen, haven't we, with, with Hardy sometimes snatching at chances. I don't think it's down to necessarily confidence, just ring rust. You know, he's not getting eight, ten chances a game to be able to bury two or three. So I mean, that's a, both of those numbers are slight exaggerations, but you get my point. Um, so I think that is the best way forward. We're going to concede anyway. So, well, we have been, you know, when was the last time we kept a clean sheet? Um, or how many have we kept in the past sort of, you know, in the season? So it's likely we're going to concede anyway. So let's just put what we can on the front foot. Um, and at least, at the very least, if we're going to go down, it'll have been entertaining. You know, that's one thing. You know, if we'd have gone down under Schumacher, I don't think anyone would have said it was a rubbish ride. Um, and and I think that's, you know, going at, not, let's go out with a bang and not a whimper. I think that's probably my last uh, comment of the night. So, let, you know, we've got six games. Let's go out. Um, let's go down fighting. Yeah, you managed, to, you managed to stretch that out nicely. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll get round to you all quickly. A couple of quick, uh, I suppose, quicker um, questions, which, I again, I've lost. Um, Toby asks, what avenue do you think that we should go down next? Somebody tried and tested or, or another gamble on a young, untried, unknown manager? Um, Graham, you're not a fan of the big firefighter in Warnock? Are you a fan of a, a young up and coming, or does this? Well, come I, I think part of the problem with the January recruitment was it was the middle of the season, mm. so we've got a close season to properly assess. Some managers will be out of contract. Some it'll be easier to prize away from their clubs rather than mid season. So I, I have to say we've got to go for some experience. I don't necessarily say it has to be championship. But there are up and coming managers. I mean, the one I quite liked went to Swansea, Luke Williams, who was at Notts County and got them up. He was the sort of manager that I think that we doubt. Um, they, I think they appointed him the day before Ian Foster was appointed, or very close. It's that sort of manager I would like. But the most important thing is the man management. And particularly for me, the one R girl. We've got to believe in him. He's got to put himself about. He's got to be with the fans, not necessarily be one of them. And I'm not saying he's got to go down the dolphin for a few pints, but he, he's, he's got to embrace what we had because what we had in the last four years or so was a magical period in the club's history. And it's been decimated in just under three months. And we can't afford that mistake again. So experience, yes. Youthfulness, quite happy with if he's got a proven track record. But he's got to be up front and centre as the man that leads the club. Yeah, there was a manager who often frequented the Dolphin that managed to keep us in the Football League. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Adam, on to, on to Friday and, and in general, obviously massive game um is it is it the biggest game of the season and and on that do you think we're going to stay up yeah, well, uh, it's without a doubt the the biggest game of the season thus far until the next one i suppose but yeah this is is the one that um i i, I totally agree with, with with what ben and to be honest many others said that this is very much make or break at this point it's one of those where um the mood particularly with it being the early the early game and being on Sky, and particularly given who it's against, the mood around it will, will be completely determined by, by by what we see on Friday night. Um, will, will we stay up? Um, you know, if we win, we've got every chance, and if we don't, I think we're done for. I think that's the easiest way to put it. And personally, maybe it's heart rolling overhead, but I think we will win. I think we've done this in just enough time, and I think we're going to have players now who are desperate to prove that they weren't the problem. That they're, they're actually, you know, it, it, it was the coach. They, they've not got Ian Foster to hide behind now. If that was the case, they've got to come out fighting. And with that, with the fact that we've got some some renewed confidence, with the fact that it, it can't be any less attacking that, than it has been, and, and going to Rotherham side, who by every metric imaginable are the worst team in the league, I do think we'll get the victory. I, I don't think it'll, it'll be cruise control, but I think we will just about squeak it. And if we do, I think that'll be just enough to keep us up. But it's it's going to be tight. Ben, thoughts on thoughts on Friday? Are we staying up. I've been saying for 
as I, as I, I'm going to repeat myself, but if we win, I think we will. And if we don't, I don't think we get the seven points we need to to stay up. It's that critical for me. I think we, we're not going to get seven points elsewhere. I'm not going to get six, even if we get a draw, I don't think we get six points elsewhere. So, yeah, I do think it is. Um, I'd like to see a 3-5-2 if we're going to go with three at the back. You can then have the wing backs, two midfielders um, supporting, you know, whether that would be Bundu or Wayne to play with Hardy, but he he's absolutely knackered. You can just see on his face when he's running around. It's just painful for him. He needs someone there. I wasn't too impressed with Bundu's. I think it's not, not yesterday, but the last performance. I didn't think he was. I think it was his worst performance of the season. But he did enough yesterday to convince me that that was an aberration. And he has some nice little touches and things. If he can, can uh, maybe you know, slip some little balls through to, to to Hardy to run onto, I think that could be um, the way to go. But we'll, we'll see what what the play. You know, whether it's going to be Juznip laying out the the plan, or they're going to all come together. The 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 staff and the players and say what do we think lads just for this one at least we need to win what are we going to do um this really is crunch um you know i don't think the games you know like the leicester game etc are we expecting to get anything from that i do think this is probably the biggest game of the season and maybe we'll get to hull um you know maybe if depending on what we get here qpr will be bigger but i really do think this is going to be you know it's got to that point where it's, it's this really is make or break yeah sam's the headliner we're the, we're the warm up act so uh you got 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 a second warm up act coming next. Yeah, we're we're, we're due to be joined by uh, rotate you guys out and and the, uh, Chris Errington is waiting in the wings. I can I can see you backstage there, Chris. You can't see me. Well, you can't what see. A great me. job, um, great job he's done over the past yeah. thirteen weeks. I think should be said. I think a lot of fans have echoed that sentiment. So, um, yeah, exactly. Um, Graham, before before we switch you all out, then. Um, Thoughts on, on Friday and, and do we stay up? Well, I think we forget the problems Rotherham gave us in Shuey's last game. I mean, Tom Eaves is all over us and that worries me. And I'm not an advocate of Dan Skur coming back particularly, but if there is one game and Tom Eaves is in the opposition, Dan Skur is the man to nail him physically and mentally and any other way that's legal. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get a win against Rotherham, but I, th I work on the principle of average points. And if we get a draw at Rotherham, win it against QPR, that's four points. Um, but it, ultimately, it's not just how we do, it's how badly Huddersfield and Sheffield Wednesday do. In theory, we could lose all six games, and if they do all, lose all six games, we stay up. So... I think we need to be watching what Huddersfield and Sheffield Wednesday do. Wednesday had a bit of a renaissance and they've fallen away after the hammering at Ipswich. Uh, Huddersfield, don't know, jury's out. If we can get a win somewhere and get above Birmingham and Stoke, and, and then it gives us a little bit more leeway for the results to fall our way. But I'm <coughs> all prepared for the squeakiest of squeaky bum times at home to Hull. That's going to be... I think we'd be watching our smartphones more than we're going to be watching the game. I suspect. Mm. Back in the day, get those um those old portable radios out with the big air. Yeah, 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 yeah. The old transistors. Yeah. Right. I think this is where we say good night to you three, and we swap you out. Yeah, um, thank I'm you. Do... Cheers, guys. See you soon. Yeah. I'm going to uh, do this incredibly, um, incredibly smoothly. There we go. How's that? There we go. Look at that. Magic. A big switch. Um, thanks, thanks for joining us, Chris. I think we're gonna we're gonna run through you first. Um, and I've got a few questions lined up. A few people in the chat as well. Um, obviously, you've had a bit of a busy week, so we want to we want to get you off to bed uh, if we can. Um, obviously, before we get on to the dismissal, uh, just a quick one. Obviously, Ben mentioned it there, and I think I echo um, most of the fan base that you know to say the work you've done in recent weeks has been excellent. I think you've really pressed um, well in, in, in your, um, in your presses. Um, but obviously before we get into the dismissal, what, what was Foster like as a person? It, it never really felt like he wanted to bond with the fans. Did you feel any of that too in your time working with him? Obviously, um, you know, there was a few questions about his relationship with players as well. So I don't, I don't know. What was he like? Yeah, um, well, thanks first of all for the invite to join you tonight and uh, talk about uh, Ian Foster's dismissal. It was it was a late night last night, wasn't it? It was about 10 mm. to 11 when the announcement was 
officially confirmed, although I think it was it was well known before then that it was going to be happening. So, mm. yeah, a bit of a late night last night. So I will try and uh, catch up on a bit of sleep uh, this evening. But um, what was Ian Foster like as a guy? I mean, he, he was a nice guy. Um, and this is, I think, one of the problems he had was that the fans only ever really saw him in a press conference environment. And mm. particularly when results start going badly, um, it's not always the happiest place to be when you're sat there as a journalist asking questions to a manager whose team aren't playing well, aren't getting results, who's coming under pressure, who's been booed by his own fans. Um, you're never going to see the best of a person in that particular environment. Um, mm. I do remember when we met him for the introductory press conference, which you know was only you know, 88 days ago or, or whatever it was, that um, after we that sat down and did the formal question and answer with Neil Dewsnit, Andrew Parkinson and Ian Foster, we got invited into the players' lounge for tea, coffee and biscuits with the purpose of just having an off-the-record chat with Ian Foster to get to know him, to have a chat, mm. to find out a little bit about, you know, his time in Saudi Arabia, family moving over to this country and that's the first time in all my time covering Argyle that I've had that experience of meeting a manager and then having a informal mm. chat and get to know him. So I feel that one of the unfortunate sides of, of his short tenure at Argyle was is that I don't think people really got to know the real Ian Foster. Um, they saw him in the sound bites, they saw him in the press conferences. And, you know, if, if he'd done a fans forum, if he had arrived in the summer, if the fans had had a chance to sort of get to know him a little bit, um, then they might have cut him a bit more slack for longer. But mm. because he was thrust in, press conference defeat, press conference bad result, press conference, it, 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 it didn't really help him build up the rapport with the fans that he clearly needed to have. And unfortunately, he, he didn't have. Yeah, I'm just interested in your thoughts as well on the decision by Simon Hallett to make a change so late in the season. Obviously, you know, uh, previously we had the issue with, he said, um, you know, about leaving it a bit too late with Adams. Um, what What are your thoughts on the change? Do, do you think it's the right time? Yes, it was, it was the right time. You could argue after the Preston defeat, when the, the mood at home part was, was pretty awful, wasn't it? That that would have been probably a better time because then you'd have had a two week international break and um, everything would have had a time to, to settle down. But in, in all my dealings with Simon Hallett over the years, who's always been very polite and helpful and, and, and everything to me uh, and to the other media as well. Um, I should add, he, he is a mid to long term thinker. Mm. He, he doesn't take decisions for the short term. He doesn't take knee jerk reaction um, so I think he probably gave Ian Foster a little bit longer in charge than a lot of other clubs would, would have done in the circumstances. But, um, so I, I can see where he was coming from. You know, they've just signed a guy on a really long contract. Um, they would have been desperately hoping that things would have turned around. They could have stayed up and then maybe with a summer of a rebuild and things would have settled down and then they could have got going. But, um, it was a strange old atmosphere, wasn't it, on Easter Monday against Bristol City? Mm. You could, you know, the, you could just sense it wasn't quite right, was it? And if they got a goal in the first half an hour when they played well, you know, who knows what would have happened? But um, it turned out the way it did, and um, you know, it was not long after the game that you started to get the vibes that you know there's going to be something happening pretty soon, and, and that's what happened. So. Uh, on a human level, I, I put it in a piece I wrote in the Herald today and in Plymouth Live. Uh, on a human side, I, I feel really sorry for him. His, his family have moved back to this country, uh, wife, young son, um, really difficult for them. Um, as football fans, we all see things, you know, from the from our club's perspective and it's black and white. Um, but when you get to know somebody, even for a short spell of time like I did, and you, you get to interact with him, you see him, you, you speak, you chit-chat, you know, I, I think if you're in that, situation you would perhaps have a little more sympathy than perhaps the the fan that's never met ne never met the man and, and never spoken to him 
yeah, I think I think that's a, a a real um key thing to remember. Obviously, there are you know humans involved here as well. He has still lost his job, um, uh, even if he is going to be well uh, remunerated for that. Um, yes. you know, um, you mentioned Hallett already. Were you surprised? And obviously, he's a mid to long term thinker, as you say. Were you surprised that there was no form of public backing for for Ian? Obviously, we had Foster, Hardy, Edwards, Houghton in recent weeks try and rally the fan base for support, but we heard nothing from the boardroom. Was that a surprise to you or, or not really? I, I made a couple of re requests, but, um, you know, I, I think the club felt that um, if they said anything, it would be interpreted as the dreaded vote of confidence. And mm -hmm. then everyone then assumes that, well, they've given him the dreaded vote of confidence. Um, they're probably going to sack him in a couple of games time anyway. So, yeah. um, you know, Argyle in situations like this, over quite a long period of time, tend to keep their cards very close to their chest. Um, I take on board what the fans say about um, the club make a lot about being open and transparent and, and were they open and transparent this time? Um, I think I, I do think, though, there are times when it is very difficult for a club to be open and transparent because whatever they then say is going to get turn to a particular person's perception of a situation. So um, um, I think you can be an open and transparent about a lot of things, but maybe when you get to the, the manager's future, it is difficult. But um, um, I, I, I can see both sides of the argument on that. But I think I get from the club's point of view why they didn't say anything, although from a journalist's and a, a fan's point of view, um, something would have been better than leaving a, a vacuum that then is filled by lots of speculation and comment from all sorts of people. Um, so sometimes you're best off getting out in front of the story than, than letting it overtake you. Yeah, there was just like a black hole, wasn't there, on like socials and stuff yesterday that just allowed a uh, rumour to, to, well, it, it turned out to be true. But um, did, did you see any indications yesterday during the, the press conference that he was likely to be dismissed. I know that he said, uh, I don't know whether that was to yourself or to BBC Devon. I think he said that he had no worries about his job. Um, so, but it, it just looks, it just looked like such a dejected uh, figure answering those questions. W w did you, did you think he was going? I, I thought there was a, there was a, a decent chance of it. Yes. Um, he was dejected, but um you know, like any good football person, he, he doesn't like losing games of football. Um, and in all of this, it, it must have been a, a, a pretty dismal time for him where, you know, the results aren't going his way. He He's not stupid. He will have known um, what the situation was and, and what it could mean for him and his future at the club, even though he'd been there for a short time. Like, like I say, I mean, even before the game, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what others feel. It, it did feel like everyone was going around thinking if we don't win today, you know, there could be a change. Um, and like I say, there was a bit of a vibe around the place. You know, people were scurrying around doing bits and pieces and you think, oh, I wonder if something's gonna, going to on. Um, and I think before the Rotherham game particularly, which, you know, is, is clearly very important, um, it, it all it all felt as though it was the right time to happen. I, regardless of how sympathetic you are to Ian Foster and whether you feel he had a fair crack of the whip or anything, I don't think anyone could argue that right now in the position that Argyle are in, that it's the wrong decision to have replaced him. You can debate about whether it should be Neil Dewsnip and Kevin Nanskevall in charge, whether it should be uh, Neil Warnock, whether Joe Edwards should be leading the players or whatever view that's a, a talking point and a debate but um i think changing the manager it, it had to be done yeah you mentioned them there obviously neil and juice nipper the what the chosen ones what, what do you make of them coming back in for a another stint as as caretakers well it was in the circumstances with six games of the season left it was probably going to be Neil Dusnip and Kevin Nanskeville or, or Neil Warnock, wasn't it? Um, I know there's other managers that are, that are out of work and you could have potentially bought in. But um, in the circumstances, you want somebody who who cares about the club uh, and is prepared to do what it takes to um, to try and keep them keep them in the championship. Um, Neil Warnock, you know, what a, what a fantastic career he's had, manager he's been. 
Um, would have been great from a journalist point of view. Would have um, he'd have definitely fired the fans up. Um, but I, if if you were talking ten or twelve games left to go in the season, a little bit longer, where he could come in and have a little bit of a chance to make a proper stamp on on the team, then maybe yes. But we've got a game on Friday at Rotherham. We're at home to QPR next Tuesday. We've got a game against Leicester the following Friday night. And then you've got Stoke, Hull and Millwall. There's, mm. there's not going to be much time for training or anything like that. So I, I think on balance, it, in these circumstances, you're better off sticking with people that the players know. Neil and Kevin know the players, vice versa, um, and see if you can you know, get the best out of them. I thought Argyle played reasonably well when they were in charge before, didn't win a game, which, you know, is slightly concerning when Argyle need to win games now. Um, it's not a great situation for Argyle to be in. There's no sugar in it, is it? But I think in the circumstances, um, I would have gone with with Neil Dewsnip and Kevin Natskeville. Um, I'd be leaning on Joe Edwards and Jordan Houghton and people like that who've spoken very well in press conferences were recently as well try and make it a collective effort rather than one person, you know, trying to lead the way, make this a collective effort. And, um, you know, if you all pull together, sometimes, you know, really good things can happen in, in football. So that, that's my take on it, but I can understand why people would say, well, why don't you bring, why haven't they brought Neil, uh, Neil Warnock in? He's made it clear that he, he would have taken up the chance if he'd done it. And, and clearly he's got a track record for, for keeping clubs in the championship in the past. Although, you know, he has had a spell up at Aberdeen recently, which uh, didn't go very well and, and ended quite quite quickly. Yeah, obviously you mentioned the, the quick turnaround, you know, this time, what is it, basically a month to today, tomorrow, Thursday, that the season's over. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so obviously quick turnaround. Obviously uh, we saw yesterday a real sign of intent from the players and, and you couldn't really question theirs or, or the fans' efforts. Just how important is that unity going to be over the next six games? Obviously, we've heard for a while that it's this, the one Argyle uh, and it needs to be a united front now uh, more than it has been for a number of years, isn't it? Yes, it does. Um, I think any time that you've got uh, division, you know, anywhere at a football club, it certainly doesn't help matters. I do think there's, you know, a big onus on the players. I mean... We can talk about the fans, that the part they've got to play and, and what Neil Dewsnip and Kevin Nansky and the other coaching staff, uh, Simon Ireland and Daryl Flahey and everyone behind the scenes and the importance they've got. But, you know, ultimately it is down to the players. And, you know, I look at those two games over Easter and they had the chances to have put Norwich in a very difficult position on Good Friday. And I'm not saying they would have gone on to win the game, but they, they could... They should have come away from Norwich with a draw from that game. I know Norwich had more goal attempts, but clear-cut chances Argyle should have be coming away from, from that game with a draw. And in the first half an hour um, against Bristol City, they, they played with a tempo, with a passion on the front foot that everyone wanted to see from them. You have to turn that into a goal or two. And um, you, you can point... Other, ...but the players are the ones that are mainly responsible for trying to keep Argyle up now. And um, they need to, you know, um, try and press a reset button, go again. They've got different voices, different instructions. Um, I would imagine we'll see Argyle play a bit more like we we did earlier on in the season. Um, that's maybe another benefit to sticking with Neil Dewsnip and Kevin Nanskeville rather than bringing somebody else in and, and trying to tinker with styles and shapes and formations when you've really got no time to to work on things like that but um yeah it, unity is important i mean you could you could feel the club were, were putting players up in the in the last week or two and and you've obviously picked up and i'm sure lots of people did mm. it felt like they were picking players to who speak well who who put out the right line and yeah. um and uh, you know that was another factor where you think this is this is heading one way if if results don't improve very quickly and then the manager's very critical of the referee after the game against Norwich City and 
you know, that's another sign that, you know, he knows that the pressure is really on. And um, so it, it, it just felt like an accumulation of things. It was building up, wasn't it? And it was just a case of if they didn't get that win against Bristol City, it was likely to, likely to change. And, uh, and so it has done. Yeah, just um, two quick questions then uh, before we let you go. Like you said, you've had a busy week. So um, obviously Kenny's yes. asked. Will yes, you I, yes, I, yes, I will. Yeah, I, I always try to. Um, and sometimes um, managers in those situations like a little bit of time to collect their thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes they'd rather just leave it as it was. Um, I tried that with Derek Adams, for example, when he left. I got on pretty well with Derek for much of the time he was there, but he didn't really want to sort of, you know, uh, but that's each individual's choice. But yes, I will definitely uh, try and get hold of Ian and get his side of the things. And um, you know, I'd like to think that with the questions that he was asked, you know, sometimes you have to ask, you know, what, what you might call tough questions or difficult questions, but you want to try and give the manager the opportunity to state his case and his belief on what's happened, why he's picked certain players, why certain players haven't been picked, um, why he's used certain tactics, why he's done this, that and the other. The, the, the idea is to try and find out as much information as that manager is willing to give you about why they've taken certain decisions and actions. And then readers and listeners and viewers can then draw their, their conclusions from that. So um, I'd like to think that he would feel that um, although the questions were, you know, a little bit difficult at times, it was with the aim of trying to get his side of the, the situation. Yeah, the fi- final one. Are we staying up? Are we staying up? I felt pretty confident, as one of your other guests will know, I felt pretty confident all um, all season they'd stay up. Um I still think just about I heard Graham just just before I came on and he said about squeaky bum time and it feels like it's going to go maybe to the Hull City game. And and to be honest, if you said to me now that Argo will go into the last game of the season needing a win to stay up, I think I'd probably take that now. I don't know how, how you guys would feel about that. Um I don't know. It, it's, it's, it, it wouldn't be a nice experience, I know, but um I think I, if we, I just I just think back to all of those performances where we need a uh, all of those games where we need a performance like yeah you know that that game up in, in Rochdale where we should have won the game against Grimsby the MK yeah. Dons on the final day when we need a result it yeah we collapse so I'd rather not um, but so I could throw back <laughs> at you like I could throw back at you like Shrewsbury away last season when they nicked the goal at the end and and things like that um, I think as fans maybe sometimes and you know. I I can think of my club, and you you tend to remember the scars more than the uh, you know the the happy memories and things like that. But um, I think I think they can do it. Clearly, they're going to have to score goals. Um, can they beat Rotherham? Yes. Can they beat QPR? Yes. Um, Leicester would be tough, although they're, they're not on a great run of form at the moment, are they? Um, can they beat Stoke? Well, who knows that the Stephen Schumacher factor in that game? Anything could happen in that. Could they beat Millwall? Well, Millwall have just lost to Rotherham. Could they win at home on the last day of the season when they need a point or three um, to stay up? Yes, they can do that. So, yeah, it's it's not looking as good as it did a couple of weeks ago. Certainly not. But um, there's enough games there, enough there's enough points they can take if they can galvanise themselves, play like they did in the first half an hour against Bristol City, start sticking away a couple of chances. Um, yeah, I, I still think they can do it, but you know, we all know it's going to be difficult. Appreciate you jumping on, Chris. We'll let you go. Um, my pleasure. Sorry, not my pleasure. Always happy to to come on and have a chat. Hopefully, uh, after the season's ended, we can uh, maybe have a have a catch up and a, a debrief on how it all turned out. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. We'll pencil you in for that and I'll, and I'll be sure to follow you up on that email. Um, really you. appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll drop you off the screen because it's not okay. as easy from your side, but um, feel free to stay and listen if you if you really want to. Um, replacing Chris is um, James from One Team in Devon. I haven't introduced the other two yet. Uh, everybody will know the, the, the mug in the top right-hand corner. 
uh, that belongs to Joe Bell, not the mug down the side that you can sign up to our little uh, uh, <laughs> mailing list to get uh, 10% off when we launch our shop uh, very, very soon. And below him, Nick Saunders Smith, the OG of the original podcast. Um, how are you, Nick? You good? I am pretty good, thanks. Yeah, I'm just going to jump straight in. Just give us your initial thoughts on on the sacking of Ian Foster. I mean, it's it's been covered a lot already, really. Uh, a lot of people said a lot of what a lot of us thinking. Um, I mean, Chris just said it then. It kind of had to happen. I think most people agree that, maybe not most, but a lot of people agree that it probably should have happened after Preston. Um, uh, Oops, sorry, I can hear, I hear an echo. Um, yeah, it probably should have happened after Preston. Um, yeah, it's just... I don't know. I don't really feel that relieved because I don't think that it should be Doosnip taking us forward personally um, for a couple of reasons. I'd say, one, I don't see that uniting the fans, which we all know that's going to be really key in our survival efforts, having one real strong unified voice at Home Park. Um, I mean, the moment is announced and going on 24 hours later nearly, there are still people talking about, oh, no, it should be Doosnip. Um, the fact that um, Warnock's come out and said that he would have done it if he was asked has only continued that. I Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't think Doosnip was the way to go because I don't think he's going to unite the fans. I think it's going to be a harder job for him than last time. Last time, essentially, he was just continuity from from Stephen Schumacher this time, he can't do continuity. He's got to actually fix the problem. Yeah, I, I, I've got big question marks over one that he can do it. Um, in January, I said that I didn't want it to be Warnock. I was fully behind Hallett and the board when they wanted to do their long-term appointment. It didn't seem, with half, half season's a long time to go, it's not a firefighter's time. I didn't think that was time for bringing someone like Warnock then personally. But right now, you want to galvanize the players you want leadership you don't necessarily need a tactical revolution i can see the positives for Doosnip in that obviously he's been working with the team but when you look at his credentials it's what four games of league management of club management nothing in a relegation battle so you can question his his suitability there and of course you could in theory bring in warnock and you've still got Doosnip there to support him so it doesn't need to be a complete revolution when you've got like Chris was just saying, Houghton and Edwards there as two clear leaders who we know from what Shuey said last season, they were stepping up into more of a tactical leadership position. They were working more on the tactic side of it. I think Doosnip said earlier in the season that the two of them were working very closely together when he was doing his interim management. So you can have them supporting him along with along with Doosnip from the background. So I think that's probably the way it would have gone. The charismatic leadership to get all the fans back on side. And just trying to, just trying to will our way over the line because I don't think it's necessarily going to be about bringing a tactician at this point. But I don't know. That's that's probably my take. Relieved that Foster's gone. Disappointed that we've probably lost two weeks and at least a point had he been removed at YC to be the right time. And a bit frustrated that you know is Doosnip the person, particularly with the the must win of all must wins on Friday, really. Before I ask you for your thoughts, Joe, um, 1,660 of you, um, there are more, 1,660 of you are currently watching us on Twitter. Go and subscribe to us on YouTube, please. Thank you. Is that, is that kind enough? Joe, go on, follow it up. Give us your thoughts. You definitely haven't chewed our ears off in the group chat. So. No, I haven't. Um, and I, you know, everyone who wouldn't have been watching ITV West Country or listening to BBC Radio Devon this morning wouldn't have already heard this already. Um, do go check them out on, you know, your catch up platforms if you haven't already. Um, what are my thoughts? Uh, there was an air of inevitability, wasn't there? Um, it was it was coming. It was always going to be about when. Um, I agree totally with what Nick says. Perhaps, you know, it's Hindsight's a wonderful thing in sport and particularly football, but that two weeks now seems like a real waste for me. Um, I understand that the football club wanted to give him as much time as possible. I think, you know, whatever your opinions on Ian Foster, the guy are, we all wanted this to work because almost every decision that this board have made since they took overall control at the club has been positive and has worked. 
Um, so we didn't want there to be a blot on the copybook. Nobody wants that. Um, so there's that. There's, I mean, I've got so many thoughts, Aaron. I'm going to be on for the rest of the night. I won't throw them all on now. Um, but the overriding feelings are it had to happen to keep us in the championship, I think. Um, you know, it, there's no guarantee that this is going to keep us up. Of course there isn't. Um, but it gives us one last fighting chance of doing it. Um, and overall, I have a, you know, I'm a human and I have empathy towards a young man who's trying to make a career out of football. And unfortunately, a, a, a re, you know, he's been thrown into the deep end, A, by himself, He's put himself in this position by applying for a pretty big and difficult job straight off the bat of international management. But I also feel like he's been put in the deep end a little bit by the football club. Um, there has been a number of issues over the three months. The key ones being the lack of support staff-wise that Ian Foster received. Now, that needs to be clarified by somebody and quickly as to why it took what? 10 weeks to get Ian Foster a number two, 10, 12 weeks. We're told that we're going to wait for the right person to become available. And the person that we choose had been available for three months before he's appointed. So, you know, there's, there's that. Um, and then there's the, you know, I understand what Chris is saying that if Argo had come out with something in the last couple of weeks, it would have seen as a proverbial um, vote of confidence. But I, I just feel like they've sort of hung him out to dry a little bit. And something is better than nothing. And, you know, we'd have all drawn our conclusions. Of course we would have. But we were getting a lot of things fed to us last season when everything was going swimmingly. We were riding the wave. We were getting all these statements and videos and interviews and everything everywhere. It was everywhere you looked last season. Um, this year when things haven't gone right, we've had radio silence. Now, look, Simon Hallett has his own life. He's not in the country all the time. He's got time zones to deal with. He's got other business interests. I understand that, you know, he's said it himself that, um, you know, he's sort of, a, what is it, a non-executive chairman, wasn't it? He called himself years ago. That's why he's put this, this strong leadership team in place here in Plymouth. Um, but I just feel like something to come out and say, you know, as as we put to Chris, you know, um, I'm not letting you take the credit for all those questions, Aaron. You made me type them. Um, that um, type some we very have... long words that I can't say. So thanks for that. Yeah, I I apologise for, for making you say <laughs> some of those. Um, but we've had, you know, as I said, we've had Houghton, Edwards, Hardy, um, you know, even Foster himself come out and try and issue a rally cry. Now, we finally got that rally cry from Simon Hallett at the bottom of yesterday's statement, but it's taken to the sacking of the head coach to get it. And I just feel like something like that before the Easter period, he doesn't even have to mention Ian Foster. If he doesn't want to mention the head coach because it will be shown as a vote of confidence, that's fine. But I'd have really liked something. It wouldn't have made a, It probably wouldn't have made a jot of difference to anyone's feelings. But just something to come out. Give us something to cling on to. Um, did you see what didn't Preston happen. did? Um, with low earlier in the season. Yeah. Yeah, that I think yeah. I saw some Argyle fans mentioning that that was an option there. Was, was that like a joint statement by Risdale and Lowe together? Yeah, it was. I think it was the three of them, wasn't it? Risdale, Lowe and Craig Hemmings, who, who'd obviously taken over after Trevor's, Trevor's passing. So um, something like that would have been fine. You know, as I say, even if it's just Hallett, a, a four sentence statement saying we need you more than we've ne I've needed you since I've been in the club. Um, it didn't happen. Look, that's all in the past. Um, I know we're here to reflect on on the past at the moment, but um, I think once the clock strikes half past ten or whenever it is, we press this end stream button tonight, Aaron. It's got to be full focus on Rotherham, and I'm going to throw the first cliche of the evening in and the six cup finals that lay ahead. I mean, if that was your short answer, I'd hate to hear your long one, James. Yeah, I've been waiting patiently. Wait, I'm I'm on until the end as well. I've got plenty more to come. Jump in whilst you can, James. Go on, give us your thoughts, your initial thoughts. 
Yeah, I mean, there's so like Joe said, there's so many disparate thoughts um, about Foster, about the, the last hours of um, of his reign. Um, but I think whatever happens, the, there will have to be some kind of inquest. Whatever happens at the end of the season, whether it's um, whether we go down or stay up, that what has led us to these decisions that's been taken this season, and is the governance of the club, which has been such a a big part of of success how is that how has that functioned through the last six months because we've got Stu Slip stepping into this role he's Foster's boss the 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 line of command is is uh is Foster Jew Snip he's you know his line manager who reports to the board so any decision Foster makes that beyond kind of day-to-day -day running should be sort of okayed by juice nip. So when Foster came in and was a, as a rookie manager at this level, allowed to change the system to how he wanted it, allowed to change the approach to how he wanted it. We had these uh, comments about how much information the players were taking on board and then very quickly into a, like a serious run of games that should have obviously be okayed by juice nip. So, you've got him stepping into the role and you do wonder what he's been doing over the last couple of months because he, he's supposed to be the conduit between the board and and Foster and the team. So um, big question for me, it's just big question marks there about what he's going to bring to the table now as um, as caretaker manager. Well, what wasn't he bringing to the table as effectively Foster's manager, line manager in the... Um, over the last two months and and you know if anyone who works in any sort of structure if you're if your um if your employees or the people you manage aren't performing that's pretty much on you um and to a certain extent and we've seen foster cut off a lonely forlorn figure with no support with with no one coming in to sort of back him um so yeah it kind of leaves me scratching my head what you has been doing and and then and then feeding into that why we're not looking at someone with the experience to in the in the league so um yeah tons of tons of questions there again sorry to go on with that that governance also goes down to as we said the support staff we won't go there even the recruitment in in um in january if we knew that it was likely that a high risk of azaz leaving then what where was the where was the like for like replacement replacement there where we, we don't seem to have, have signed players that fit. We don't even seem to have signed players that follow the data mantra of the club. They seem to be either people Foster had a relationship with or had a knowledge of. They, they, they were such young players, they didn't even have data to go with them, some of them. So um, Sousa and um, JB, there's no data there. So um, it feels like we've thrown away a lot of the governance and, and, and processes that have led us to make good decisions. And um, yeah, I think when this season finishes, we need to work out how that happened and uh, and how that doesn't happen again. Yeah, on, on exactly that, Nick, Richard Sloman asks, do we need to talk more about the recruitment uh, whilst it is 100% the right call on Foster signing half-fit players, recall clauses on our best players, no new striker in January. Is there an argument to say whoever's in charge would face a very tough task keeping us up in the league with our budget and that recruitment? Uh, the, well, it's a loaded question because it's assuming that the recruitment is poor, which I think we generally all agree with, but you know, it might be that players haven't performed but the recruitment itself wasn't necessarily poor but it's assumed that it's both poor and that that's connected to having not having enough money um sam and i were discussing way back in early february that we thought it was a um it could have been linked to what seemed to be the strategy when we first got promoted back to league one which was we sold now canavan we brought in a bunch of extra loanies having already had a very young defense and we wondered if it was a case of stockpiling money for the summer knowing that players are more expensive in january knowing that um, we were in a decent position to survive. And we didn't necessarily need to throw money at it. And by stockpiling it for the summer, we'd get better value for money. We've got absolutely nothing to back that up. But that was a thought that we had, because, I mean, I don't see where the Schumacher and backroom staff million, alleged million pounds went. I don't see where the uh, Gillespie money went. We basically brought a player in for every player that we let out. They didn't seem, I, are we paying that much more for Divine and JB and so forth, but and so I, I don't know if it's budget related, but 
like I'm personally for me, like Foster had to go for all the reasons we've all gone on about. But do snip seems to me to be the person most at fault for the post January collapse in he's the person who set the strategy that took us back to three four three. I personally think that's heavily influenced this. I know people disagree with me, but that's my perspective on that. He obviously brought Foster in. He's the person who oversees ultimately all the signings that we make. Um I see comments there about Divine replacing Azaz, but what about Kundal? I mean we lost Azaz and Kundal at 22 of as you can tell, there's an article coming out tomorrow. But 22 of 50 goals up until that point were directly influenced, got scored or assisted by Azaz or Kundal. And we've lost both of them and brought in one player, Alfie Devine, with no minutes at championship level to replace him. Um, sorry, I'm trying not to grin at the comments. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just... Yeah, it's, hard, then, it's harder than it looks, especially when they're aimed at you. I believe you. Um, I mean, you can take another level too. Allegedly, he had a falling out with Shuey. Given the comments in the press, you can see that, that might, there might be something in that. He ultimately hired Foster, fired him too late in my eyes, might have been involved in should we stay in England? I don't know. For me, I think I look at this and think that most of the questions need to be answered by this is obviously tangential to the original question that was asked. Um, but I, I look at this and see Do Snip more involved than Foster. Do Snip's got I don't think he necessarily needs to go though. I mean, if he goes down as the figurehead manager, then he probably is surely gonna go. Um but he's definitely got questions to answer. And I what well, I imagine to Hallett, not to us of course. Well, Maybe a fans forum, but he's definitely got questions to answer to Hallett in terms of what's gone wrong here. Why would you make such a significant change when you didn't necessarily need to midway through a season? And that's ultimately taken us from looking quite comfortable to, well, yeah, it's probably going to the final day, whether we like it or not. If you assume that it's going to be about 47 points is the you know, number of points that goes down and 48 keeps you up, then one win leaves us three points away from that. And so one win and we'll be in in touch on the last day. I think it's most likely whether we stay up or go down, it goes to the final day regardless. Sorry to to go away from the Saki and bring it on to, to Rotherham because I don't want to touch on some of Joe's questions and I sort of want to sneak in a cheeky um, Alfie Divine ref watch. Uh, really quick one, Joe. Um, but obviously looking ahead to, to Friday's fixture then, uh, do you see us being able to go up there and, and get all three points, James? Yeah, I mean, we certainly can. What needs to be addressed is is chance creation, and that has dropped off massively under um, under the dying days of, of Foster. And we need to. We have obviously been creating more away from home, but um, Juice Nip and Nance need to find a need to find a system or revert to a system. Or get us firing in some way that um, that they've got to tread the line between re- solving some of the problems that um, Foster's created or faced, and also not reverting to the exact same problems that we faced under Schumacher, where we were lucky to come away from the uh, Rotherham game at home with a with a win. So, um, as we spoke about earlier, there's no. Um, there's no sort of continuity exercise where you just sort of keep going, keep going, keep going um, to keep doing what you're doing. There needs to be a change. There needs there needs to be a quite precise change, and they've got less um, they've got less talent at their disposal just by uh, through in injuries and and the players they didn't have before. So um, yes, of course we can get a result. Um, you know. Rotherham obviously picked up uh, picked up a result last weekend. Of course, we can get something. We need a new manager bounce. We need um, we need belief. We need bravery. We need um, yeah. We need an injection of um, of of impetus and just got to hope that the squad were affected by the atmosphere under Foster and that they're. Um, able to able to produce something that the, the, the sort of the pressure off the free you know the sort of freedom to express themselves and create yeah obviously um joe this is where i'm going to shoehorn it in i'm sort of flip flapping all over the place here obviously one player who won't be present 
uh, on Friday is Alfie Devine. He'll be suspended after his red card on Monday. So do a quick, do a, do a quick analysis of that. We've you like a ref? We've literally got 2,100 people watching. I reckon they're all here for Wrath Watch. They're all avid Keith Stroud fans. Um, look, when you see the name Keith Stroud on the um, the appointment, you know that he's going to be the star of the show, isn't he? It's his performance. He he's the he's the circus ringleader, if you like. Um, my thoughts on the Alfie Divine red card. Um, Ian Foster had more of a problem with the first yellow than the second, I believe, um, having listened back to his post-match press conference. Now, the first yellow is where the player he um, impedes, if you like, picks the ball up deep in our half, carries it about 30, 40 yards. Devine's having a good pull at his shoulder, his shirt. It's it's soft. Like, there's no... He's not, like, yanking his shirt off like that. He's, he's literally just got a little grip of his shoulder. Um, and as the player feeds the ball out to the right the lad goes to ground there's no advantage Keith Stroud tries to play the advantage brings it back um and books him look do I think it's soft yes do I think it's a yellow probably because Devine's gone with him for 20 25 yards um he's trying everything he can to to stop the player running now He's doing a pretty good, he's doing a pretty bad job of it. Let's be honest. The lad's always half a yard in front of him, and Devine doesn't really get a good grip of his shirt. Um, and he the, the Norwich player Norwich. That's see, that's the stupid thing. I want to come on to the kit in a minute, Aaron, as well. He shouldn't be wearing two pairs of green shorts. Pathetic. Um, but the Bristol City player talking then throws about all the important things. Exactly. Yeah, that's what the people are here for. He throws himself to the ground. Now, then you get onto the second yellow card. And I do think Ian Foster somewhat threw him threw him under the bus a little bit with his comments in the press. Um, he didn't exactly help Alfie Devine out at all. When he talks about protecting the players in previous press conferences, um, he well and truly hung him out to dry by saying, I think his words were, when you're on a yellow card, you can make a tackle like that. And does he get the ball? Don't know. Um, does he get Plenty of the player, yes, probably after getting the ball or even as he's getting the ball. Um, but the big problem with me, and the, this is what I say about loads of decisions, is that players always put themselves in a position to make the referee make a decision. And, it, you know, I know I'm having a little dig at Keith Stroud, but when you're on a yellow card, for Christ's sake, don't let Keith Stroud in front of a full house at any football stadium make a decision because he's going to send you off. He's just going to do it. It is a red card. Um, it's two very silly fouls. Does it have a great impact on the game? Probably not. If I'm honest, I don't think we were really contributing anything worthwhile to the second half. I, I struggle to remember too many shots in the second half. I certainly don't remember the keeper making anything that you can class more of a routine than a routine save. Um, so it's a red card. It doesn't help the situation. It only allows Bristol City to make a mockery of how we were um, try to cope with it. I, th I think we actually ended up going to a 4-2-3 or 4-2-3 or something ridiculous. Like we completely sacrificed the midfield. Um, we played Bundu, Whitaker, and Hardy up front, and we literally just had a wave of players there, a wave of players there, and nothing in the middle. And Bristol City just ran through us and could have scored freely. So, um, look, Alfie Devine will learn from that. That's the important thing. And we said it when these players come in, Ian Foster said it himself, and he is right. Look, we don't want to hear it at the moment because we're in a relegation battle and we need players to do everything they can to help us. Um, but these players are always on a learning journey. Every game for them is one step on their development. And whilst it might not help us at the moment, it's only going to make them, you know, a decent footballer. So we do have to remember that. And um, I I'm so somewhat happy feel... Spurs. I'm so happy for Spurs. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm more happy for Stoke City. We might get him on loan next season, probably. But um, I, I do 
think I am somewhat disappointed by the reaction on social media that went Alfie Devine's way yesterday. Um, we shouldn't be reacting the way we did. Look, we all have opinions on um, what you know. Did he did he try to get sent? I, you can have you can make your own conclusions and whatever you want, whether you think Alfie Devine's a good player or not. But we don't call players out and throw abuse the way that we did to a young player the way we did yesterday and that's somewhat disappointing for me um but he'll learn and he'll i'm sure he'll be back in and around the squad what it's only a one game suspension isn't it because it was two yellow so he'll be back for the um the qpr game on tuesday night and uh you know we're going to need everybody we we have available to us so um yeah move on aaron it's time for something else. We're bored of ref watch. Keith, Keith Stroud's had enough airtime on this podcast tonight. At least he's um, at least he's back for Tuesday. Yeah, Nick, do you see do you see Friday as a potential banana skin? You know, I'm actually delighted that they won on Monday because it's prevented a week of oh, typical Argyle. We're going to be the first side to lose to Rotherham in 2024. Um, so that's good, and. Uh, I, I don't know. So Rotherham need to win if they don't win, they're officially relegated. I mean, they're as good as down anyway, but that's just another fun little thing to add to it. Do they want to be relegated on TV or alternatively would having been down have released them and they would have played with a level of freedom? I don't know. Um, It's banana skin central because the pressure is so high on us. We don't know what lineup there's going to be. We don't know what tactics there's going to be. I mean, something's going to have to change given Divine. Presumably, Bundu or Callum Wright's going to come in. I have, I have no idea. It's so much change in <laughs> the demand for Sam. Um, it's so much change in such a short space of time, and the TV cameras don't help. Oh, that's another fun thing. Have we lost every single televised game this season? Am I right in saying that? Leeds twice. Not on the red button. Not on the red button. It was on the red button. Southampton twice. Yeah, Southampton twice. Um, I know there's another one in there. Sheffield Wednesday. That was TV, right? I'm yeah, sure there's was, another one as well. Was, that was TV. Um, yeah, we've lost every... I'm sure we've lost every televised game. So, like, I I, I don't know. It's just... I, I I didn't mind actually Foster still being in charge for that one because his, his away performance has obviously been better. His away record is decent. And I don't know. I like. I don't like the idea of turning up and trying to be attacking to Rotherham, and then doing to us what they did at Home Park, which is playing it long, hitting on the counter, and getting a scrappy, annoying. Win. Obviously, we beat them eventually, but getting a scrappy, annoying win potentially. So I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a relatively horrible game to watch. I don't think it's going to be very enjoyable, but obviously we've got the quality to win it. So it's just about finding a way to do that. Uh, Nick, Nick and James, I know you didn't really hop on to talk about Rotherham. Um, you, you're going to be swapped out soon. So, is there anything you want to you want to mention about the the departure of Ian Foster before we before you leave before you depart? That you haven't already covered. Yeah, just an observation might might be uh, some people might find it wider the mark, but I just thought Brist- the Bristol City game was the kind of like everything about the Foster era in one game. Like I thought the the set, I thought he set up quite well, changed things up. Um, I quite like the way that we approached the game. Sort of, I thought it was quite a, a, a decent piece of sort of uh, coaching where we were some uh, divine or Houghton was dropping back into the into the defence for a, as a five. You know, we were spreading play. That first twenty minutes was just was, was excellent. I thought, um, and then we didn't create any clear cut chances. And then when Bristol City changed the game. Um, there's the comments uh when Bristol City changed the game he had no reply and he had he had no no answer to to to, to their changes and and that's what ultimately told um so if you want to look at 90 minutes summing up and book ending foster era is kind of all there uh you know sort of good coaching ideas um some excellent play and there has been some excellent play for his tenure but inability to change and the difference between a coach and a manager um summed up in one performance really so sort of a a fitting end i thought we were chatting about the game earlier me and james um oh all right is that loud yeah sure (laughs) we have a side chat (laughs) 
uh, we, yeah, we were chatting. Oh, you're allowed to have a little chat with Chris on the side, but <laughs> no, podcast <laughs> contributors. We have a side but chat set up from the original uh, Argyle Life. Oh, are yeah. they? Oh, right. We, Carry um... on. <laughs> you want to keep us apart so that the reaction will be genuine the first time we get on for the podcast. <laughs> um yeah we were chatting earlier and i was i was disagreeing in a bit with that which was um i didn't like the performance on monday i or rather i didn't like the tactical shape i i thought it showed to me that foster had not given up but like was a bit defeated that <clears throat> he's gone for this formation for the first time that i'm sure he obviously knows how to lay down a 4-3-3 but i mean it felt to me like he was trying to give in to what the fans have been calling for and go back to what had worked for Chiri a bit but in particular, um, like you look at the way Shuri's 4 through 3 worked, one of the key bits of the season, inverted fullback coming in, the box midfielder that Pepper made popular last season, and that allowed more attackers to get the ball higher at the pitch. And we've got attacking mids and centre mid, whereas what we had here was a proper flat back four, so the ball was always going wide to fullbacks, and we're trying to go around people by and large. The centre mids, they weren't Azaz or Kundal, they were centre mids they didn't push on too much they didn't really threaten in the box and really create much and ultimately that left us with you know trying to go around them ball getting wide to the wingers but they're all quite isolated not working together and ultimately when bristol city worked it out after about 25 minutes we didn't really get forward much aside from the odd counter so i think the worrying the thing that worried me about that is it shows that you know you need skill good coaching a real refined tactical plan to make a system like Chewies did work, and it's not just the case of Doosnip comes in, rolls the clock back, 4 3 3, throw the players down in formation, and they're going to start singing in harmony again. That's what kind of concerned me. And so I'm a little bit worried that if that's what we try at Rotherham, they're just going to set up in a compact formation, press a bit, work out how to stop the service, and then, then it's on Doosnip to work out a way to make it work if that's how it works. But yeah, that's a bit of a concern for me that I, I, uh, I, I'm just a bit concerned about not he's got the tactical like him in to make it work, whereas last time he could very much continue what Shuri had been doing. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely mad that there's nearly two and a half thousand people watching this right now. Uh, before you go, James, quick one from Toby. Do you guys think it, the obvious unrest and disconnect among the fan base fast-tracked Foster's sacking, or do you feel it was purely a decision made by the club? I actually think it didn't fast-track the sacking. I think if it had fast-tracked the sacking, we would have seen it an international break. Um, the, the statistics spoke for themselves in terms of five five home games in uh without uh, five home games in a row without scoring setting a new club record the 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 stat the fosters record by the end anyone would have sat we wouldn't have we were probably the last team in the in the EFL that would have sacked him with those numbers so no i don't think it did um did it haste did 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 the reaction hasten some of the downfall but uh, so a uh, uh, perhaps a, a closed season debate where I don't know how much it started to make me wonder. I used to, my wife's a Leeds fan. I used to go to, to Ellen Road a lot. And when they, uh, when, when the fans, there was a period when they were league one championship, early championship, when there's fact that, that where um, Ellen Road was so toxic and, and if the result wasn't going their way, the team looked scared to play at home. And, uh, you know, I think there's a, when the dust settles and, calms down I, I don't know how much how much that played into um some of our home form by the end and and whether we we're in a vicious circle um which was only going to go one way um yeah i would have made the change earlier and i was quite a uh, support of a foster um and yeah i don't think if i think if 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 fan power ha uh, would have counted for too much in this we would have seen him um gone at least of the international break or before I, yeah, I mean, I, I disagree. Sorry, I'd quickly chime in. I, I disagree. I think it did influence things. I don't think Hallett would have done it. I, I mean, Hallett's already said, and I kind of agree, we can afford to be a yo-yo club. I don't want to be, but we can afford to be, and we can afford to go down as long as we go up in the next two seasons and still hit his five-year plan target. I think the fans going was a... Uh, was the nail in the coffin that made it inevitable, but I'll speak no longer because we need to give the people what they want. 
Yeah, the, the, <laughs> there is a, an unreal amount of um, people in the comments wanting um, Sam down. So I think this is where uh, we we bid you farewell, James and Nick. And I'm off in a minute too. Um, but um, how do I? Here we go. I'll swap you out like this. And um, first question comes from Sean. Has Sam fixed his MacBook? He's back. No, clearly not, because he's on. I, I, no, I have, I have fixed my MacBook, but I forgot to unmute myself. Um, Come on. So there's your answer. The MacBook is fixed, but I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah, but at least the camera's working, which is a much better experience than um, the other day. I think my back's still not quite the same. Um, but yeah, uh, here, um, quite a eventful 72 hours to say the least and ready to go um jack has said the the goat has entered and that must be you john <laughs> those things well go goats are goats are like famously grumpy right so yeah. no that, actually that's that's just still sam and you're you're famously a happy clapper i'm gonna i'm gonna Apparently, leave yeah. in a minute i'm gonna leave in a minute for uh for finn who's, who's backstage um but Joe, you want me to ask you the question? I can't remember the question specifically, but obviously Neil Warnock um, has been clipped up uh, on BBC Radio Cornwall by uh, Andy Davis from Twitter. Um, uh, you know, his this, comments... this isn't this isn't the this isn't the Andy Davis who failed to spot a ball had legitimately overstepped the line at Coventry. Now, no, um, no, right. What what do you, what do you make of uh, Warnock's comments and and um, I don't know. I'm going. Yeah, Take you're that. going backstage, and um, you're leaving yeah. it in my my very trusty hands. Goodbye. Um, as remember, you, um, you goodbye. Remember, there's two, nearly two thousand five hundred people watching. Tell them to go and subscribe on on YouTube. Anyway, goodbye. I will do, and I look forward to the comments that you are going to bring up over the next hour. Um, yeah. So before I take on my hosting duties um just want to add some things about the neil warnock um clip that was was sent around pretty much everywhere um earlier on today and those of you who joined us all the way back in december when stephen schumacher departed for staffordshire will remember that i put forward a very passionate case whilst the the romantic in me also um took over a little bit and suggested that perhaps with 20 games to go, that Neil Warnock would have been the uh, better choice to, to come in and, and steady the ship for the season. Um, I said then that the, the deal would have been simple. You tell Neil Warnock he's on a, what was it, a 22-23 game contract, barring cup games, obviously. Um, he would have no say in the recruitment process. He is simply there to keep morale high, which it was at the time um and just carry on with with what we were doing and we were doing some great stuff then um he made he you know his his recent career whilst he has eight promotions on his cv his recent career has been coming in and keeping clubs in this division in these situations um that didn't happen we went down the ian foster route and you know i was all for it i supported it um i was quite excited by it um and now we're in a position with just a half dozen games to go where we need to fight for our survival. And um, I'm very much of the, look, I'm I'm fully behind the decision that's been taken by the football club to appoint Neil Jusnip and Kevin Nanskeville. I totally understand it. I think it was put very eloquently earlier by Chris Errington um, and others as to why it's perhaps the continuity of it all is perhaps the best way to go about things. Um, if you take away the romantic side of, a, you know, a promotion winning manager at this football club. They're very few and far between um, in our history, certainly in recent history. Um, that, you know, coming back to save the day and, and all of that and one last dance, Sharon, and all the all the usual that comes with it. Um, there were, I, th I always felt there were plenty of positives behind bringing Warnock in as a firefighter. Um, I understand the argument that he'd have to get to know the players on a personal level and there perhaps isn't the time to do that because, as mentioned, with the schedule coming up, there's going to be very little train out, very little time out on the training pitch. Um, so 
I understand all of that, but Neil Warnock has seen enough of Plymouth Argyle this season to know what we are good at. He mentioned it himself in his interview today. He's been at almost every home game since he left Huddersfield before he took the Aberdeen job. Um, and I just feel like it would it would have given a huge lift to everybody inside the building. That's what Warnock does. That's how he does it. He doesn't go in and become a tactical genius and rip up the playbook and do whatever he feels is right. He goes in and he puts an arm around everybody in that building and makes them feel good and gives them a lift and it's all on man management. And right now, the one problem we have with this squad, in my opinion, is they're low on confidence. And you need a motivator in that dressing room. And look, it may well be a case that, and I do firmly believe that once they've made their decision, Andrew Parkinson and Simon Hallett will have definitely sounded out at least Joe Edwards and maybe a few others and asked them what they want in terms of help and support between now and the end of the season. And maybe they did say Jews, Nip and Lanskerville. Maybe they did feel comfortable in those four games before Christmas. But my gut feeling is, is that whilst I'm going to support them and I have every faith that they'll be able to keep us in the division, Neil Warnock perhaps would have given us an even greater percentage chance of keeping ourselves at bay. But that's it for the minute. That's enough of me. You've heard enough of me over the last hour. John's nodding, a bit rude. Um, but we are... <clears throat> We are here to hear the thoughts of John Alsop's Finn Allen. Finn, good evening. Um, do you want to just tell us before we begin, what shirt is that? Yeah, it's actually a thank you for somebody that said uh, to somebody that said they like my pajamas. It's actually a 1994 uh, a Nigeria World Cup shirt with JJ Okocha on the back. It's one of my favourite retro shirts that I own. So yeah. Outstanding work, and it's safe to say of all the countries in that play in World Cups, Nigeria always excel themselves in their kits. They do a fantastic job with their kits, and of course, the people's the what, people's what about king, the, um, the Cameroon onesie kit. Who remembers that? that was Is that the time. Roger Miller one? <laughs> no, it was later than that. It was like a Cameroon kit that was sewn together at the um, shirt short join. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it lasted very long, as I'm not sure it was massively practical. Uh, anyway, it was a good kit. I think, I think we'll save the kit World Cup for maybe the summer. Um, we'll have a get-together and have a kit World Cup. But let's hear from the People's King. We'll go straight to him. We're back at the familiar angle that we all know and love on our Argyle podcast, looking up at royalty. Sam Down, the departure of Ian Foster, your, your initial reaction? Um... My initial reaction was relief because I think it just gives us a lot more of a chance. Um, I will give my views on Juice Nip um, as opposed to potentially Warnock, um, which I'm sure everyone will uh, have their own view on. But certainly relief that just Ian Foster isn't going to manage another game for us. Um, the man was completely out of his depth. I think that that became obvious quite shortly as much as we all wanted to give him a chance to turn it round. It wasn't going to happen. I'm going to say I told you so on one point, which is from day one. I said as much as I want to give him a chance. I have the feeling he's been hired not because he's a good manager, but because he is a good person to manage. I don't think I could have probably said it much better, in all honesty, as much as I don't want to big myself up too much. I think he was clearly somebody who was hired to fit a mould to some extent. That's not to say that the club appointed him thinking he was going to be bad. Obviously not, because that doesn't reflect well on Hallett, Parkinson or Juice Nip. But did they hire him because I think he was he was a person who wasn't going to rock the boat, wasn't going to kick up a fuss, was going to work very easily under the director of football and not kick back against him too much? I'd be lying if I said I didn't think that played into it. I was willing to put it aside. I was willing to say, give him the best chance possible. We were all delighted after after that start and Swansea away. And I think it's been pretty much all dreadfully downhill since with the brief aberration of Middlesbrough. Um, really, I think it should have happened before the international break. I said that on the Twitter space that was so brilliantly hosted by Stan the other night. I can see it in the comments. Um, I think it should have happened after the international break. But it's done. So my initial reaction was absolutely relief. Um, I think that nobody can say the fans didn't give the lads every ounce of backing on Monday because they did. It, all I heard was support up to about the end of minute 93. 
I didn't hear anything aimed at Foster. Literally just as that final minute of play kicked in, that's the only time I heard anything about Foster. And then a little bit at full time, even then it was actually far less virulent than it was in the Preston game. Um, look, we are where we are. The sackings happened. Um, I think we are going to have to, at some point in the summer, the executives within the club and possibly us fans at fan forums are going to have to have a bit of a post-mortem of what's happened because it it went it didn't just go wrong it went so badly wrong it was frightening uh, in all honesty the obviously the, the complete lack of communication with the media the t- rumors of complete meltdown within the squad which given how many players partners of players close friends of players are liking um you know the instagram comments etc about him leaving uh i think that probably says there was some truth in it the abandonment of the style of football that we grew to know and love the one thing you could kind of say to him up till about maybe the Ipswich with Sheffield Wednesday game was hey at least the points aren't too bad at least the points the game isn't too bad but then the draw at Blackburn then three losses in a row completely screwed that the points then did start to become bad as well and I think his total points per game extrapolated over a season would have us above Rotherham and nobody else so it w- didn't just go wrong. It went so wrong. It was scary. Um, and I think we have to have a look at that because when we have a thorough recruitment process of 100 odd people, we we really you know need to think how did we w- hire somebody who was not up to it. Um, and, and look, I don't bear him any personal animosity whatsoever. I, I really don't. I, I felt sorry for him, it, it's the truth. And when, when he came over to the press, to the home fans after Preston and got absolutely barracked, I felt sorry for him. I felt sorry for him when he was being interviewed by Chris yesterday. He looked like he was about to break down. Um, and I think he probably was on the verge of it. Um, I felt sorry for him. And I'm, I'm glad that he's been put out of his misery. And I hope that he goes and has a very fruitful career doing youth coaching, which I think he is, clearly has an aptitude for. I don't think he will ever have a career again managing an EFL club. I really don't, because I think he will be so tainted by this spell that, I, you know, even if he goes and has a successful spell coaching somewhere, if he applies for a job in League One or League Two in a couple of years' time, I don't think they're going to go for him just because of this spell being such a um, disaster. Um, so I hope he excels in coaching where I think he does have an aptitude, but he clearly does not have an aptitude for... Um, uh, managing a managing of AFL club, I don't think certainly not based on that. The decision's been made. Whatever thoughts we have about um, the decision for Neil Dusip, I, I am probably going to get them out of my system on this pod when Joe asked me about them specifically. Um, but once I've got them out of my system on this pod, I'm then not going to get them out of my system anymore. I'm going to put all my efforts, all my um, energy into supporting the lads for six cup finals. This is what it comes down to. Into, into moaning about Neil Jusnip, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, it comes down to... <laughs> it comes down to six cup finals. Um, we've got we've got to get... Look, I think this has certainly given us a much better chance. I'm sure you can all read between the lines of what I'm saying. I think if we'd have hired Neil Warnock, it would have been an even better chance still. But I certainly think this gives us a much better chance. We did see some good football under Neil... Uh, Neil, well, Neil, to, to two Neils, Neil Dusip, that is. We did see some good football under him in the spell over Christmas. And let's just hope we see some more of it. I'll be there at Rotherham on Friday night and I'll be there, um, touch wood, for the remaining five games or so. Um, let's make it absolutely, you know, six cup finals, roar, roar them on with our support like we did on Monday. And let's just hope they're a bit more receptive and let's just get this done. It probably only needs seven points out of the six games. Eight, eight, an absolute push. That's two wins, two draws. And I think that would be comfortably enough. Well, relatively comfortably. And maybe even six might do it. All depends on other results. But I think we're going to need probably at least six, at most eight. That's a point a game or just over. We can do this. It's been a mistake. We've rectified it. We've not rectified it quite as quickly as I think we should have. We've not rectified it in the exact way I think we should have. But we've addressed it. Let's go and do these six games. Yeah. Um, John, I'm going to come to you next. Just a quick one before we do. There are now very nearly 2,500 people watching, which is quite mad. Um, please do continue to get your comments, your questions in, Aaron. We'll get round to showing them on screen. 
um and you know do like comment subscribe retweet share whatever it is we need to do on social media to to keep the number rising um john i want to come to you next obviously we were joined earlier by chris errington who um i didn't get to say my thanks when he was on um i think it's done a sterling job in recent weeks because i don't think it's easy to ask these tough <laughs> questions to to people you know who are potentially facing the sack you know i certainly wouldn't like somebody sticking a microphone in my face every week if i was in trouble in my job um ian foster the person though because in his press conferences it hasn't been um all roses and shun sunshine and rainbows and things you know he's not necessarily adhered himself to the supporters and there wasn't quite that connection that we've had with certainly not the previous to, to a point you could say three managers because up until the last six months adams had the the fan base in the palm of his hand didn't he really um just how much of a problem did that become for foster the the constant if you like belittling of of argyle in the press i don't think he was necessarily doing it intentionally i just think some people aren't necessarily as media trained as we've got to remember Stephen schumacher has a degree in it doesn't he in in sports media or journalism or something so he was obviously well well up to it and i think ryan lowe could talk for i wouldn't say england because scousers think they're their own nation but he could talk for liverpool um so perhaps that was a change that we couldn't adjust to but how much of a problem was that in <clears throat> in his departure in the end um yeah Derek Adams had the fan base in the palm of his hand and then clenched his fist I think that was the problem uh oh I just wanted to yeah I just wanted to quickly add um on the Chris Errington point uh because I loved having him on earlier as well I was listening to it um and actually I am uh do double in in some journalism in my day job and obviously the media industry is in a very bad we go media industry is in a very bad place uh indeed um and i think that especially you know lo local reporters getting cut left right and center you know including at titles owned by reach like plymouth live is um you know local sports reporters getting snapped up by the athletic or you know in the u.s context going to do fan blogs or whatever to have someone kind of from the outside um you know not on the side of the fans per se but someone whose job is not to represent the club not to be official media sitting there asking those difficult questions i, th I think that can go under the radar when times are good when you know the, the official media have kind of nothing they want to de-emphasize or, or hide um and i think he has been absolutely outstanding uh throughout this entire period and and yeah we shouldn't we you know, we shouldn't be considering ourselves lucky to have that it should be a basic thing that every community and every football club has but we are lucky to have it and and i hope that people appreciate him for that reason um to come on to your question i sort of see it two ways i think on the one hand uh he as you indicated obviously didn't help himself with some of his answers um i think probably the turning point um amid you know lots of other frustrating things that he said was what he said i believe after the west brom game you used to seeing us take the game to much um weaker teams arguably might have been true because our, our home fixtures in the first half of the season did skew quite early uh, quite easy compared to the second half and obviously then we were in league one before that but it's just the sort of thing you can't say particularly when we've invested so much emotionally and financially and, and time wise obviously and having a you know a sort of gung-ho don't fear anyone mentality a mentality that clearly helped us get promoted last season against teams with much bigger budgets so um that was that was i think the most the, probably the point of no return and that was a self-inflicted thing to say for sure um i think you know he could come across as kind of abrasive or patronizing at times don't think speaking to the media is probably his, his greatest skill that being said um I didn't actually hate all of his dealings with the media. And I think early on when things were going well, um, I, th I felt he actually acquitted himself quite well. I think it would have been very say, I think, I think Very Good. quickly, me and you were very quick to praise him and, and you know, really defend his corner in our group chats, weren't we, in the early days? You know, we, we thought it was a breath of fresh air what we were getting yeah. in the media. Yeah, and I think particularly after being betrayed by Shuey in, in that way, and I'm not saying Shuey was ever kind of a, you know, as much of a Ryan Lowe when it came to, you know, the fist pumps to the crowd and the kissing the badge and the fucking magnificent, uh, to, to quote Nathan Jones from the one game he won at Stoke many, many years ago. But but that's what I mean. He could, he, you know, a Nathan Jones or someone could have come in, they could have kissed the badge, they could have, you know, run around the, the pitch doing fist pumps and you know pretending to love the club foster never did that and i you know even when times were good and i think that that actually wasn't a bad thing um because i think if he'd done that early on and then 
sort of retreated into a position of, you know, defensiveness amid growing failure, he would have been even more hated. Um, which I think probably brings me on to sort of the final point here, which is, I think it's all about results. I really, really do. Like, I think he didn't help himself in the press conferences. I think he did say some stupid things. And I think there are certain fans who he alienated to the point of, they're probably, you know, I'm not saying it's anyone in this chat who doesn't have a chair who, who is among these fans, but, um, you know, alienated certain fans to the point probably of never coming back on side. But the vast majority of punters who pay their money to go to home park every week, maybe don't go to away games, maybe don't pay as, as close attention to the club as we do, would, I, I don't think they would, would have cared a jot how he sounded in press conferences if the results had been good. And if after that Middlesbrough game, we'd continue to win one, lose one, cruised into that kind of mid-table area, season was petering out, he had a couple of good performances at home in particular, and he had conducted himself more or less the exact same way in the press conferences, I, I don't think the vast majority of people would have cared. So, I, so I said earlier, it, didn't, it wouldn't have had any effect. Obviously, it would have had an effect on, on people who pay really close attention to it. Um, and obviously, you know, you, you do need to build a relationship with the fans for when times are bad so that you can then cash that in. But I don't think he really had enough time to do that, however he conducted himself early on, to be honest. And the thing that really did for him in terms of popularity was the style of football and the results. And as I see it, the bad media performances were really just rubbing salt into the wound and upsetting people who were actually watching them more than than it was any kind of significant part of his, of his downfall, it is how I see it. Yeah, um, just a very quick mention. Um... I'm going to come to you next, Finn. Um, but just a quick mention on BBC Radio Devon tomorrow morning on The Breakfast Show with John Akers. Um, Andrew Parkinson is going to be on BBC Radio Devon tomorrow and he's going to ex go through a couple of things. He's going to go through why Ian Foster was the best man for the job. And he's also going to answer the question that quite a lot of people on social media have asked today is if Neil Warnock's available, why is he not coming in? Andrew Parkinson will answer all of that on Radio Devon on The Breakfast Show tomorrow. So um, I'm sure that will be circulated in almost every group chat um, west of, of Bovey Tracy tomorrow morning. Uh, Finn, we're going we're gonna to come on to the whole Neil Jusnip, Kevin Nanskeville, um appointment in a second. Just just your take on, on Ian Foster, A, his tenure, which obviously is short, um, but also Ian Foster, the man, and and just how, you know, just trying to not necessarily, you know, we don't have to necessarily throw a huge amount of sympathy or anything like that. But we do have to remember that, as I said at the start, this is a man who's trying to make his way in club football. Um, it's going to be a tough time for him at the moment, isn't it? Because it's ended so, so quickly. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think, like, I, I as soon as the... Um the report from the telegraph um came out last night i went into the lounge spoke to my dad and the first thing i said to him i'm not happy i'm telling you this news because it's a man losing his job but is the news right and and that's how i sincerely feel about it right and we're all argyle fans and ultimately no one wants to be in the position that we are now you know for for ian foster the man and his family but mo most of all, for us as fans, we, we wanted Ian Foster to succeed because the board thought that this was the long-term plan. So, you know, the fact that we're in this position right now shows that it has gone pretty much as bad as it could have possibly gone. So that is not good for anybody involved. And now we're in not a perilous position, but certainly one of uncertainty. And with only six games to... Um, to, to save it, um, obviously it's still in our own hands. And I think that's the most important thing. That's probably why they did it yesterday, because it was the last possible opportunity, probably, that if Foster wasn't sacked before then, that I, I don't think we would have won at Rotherham had he still been in charge. And then that would have certainly seen us probably in the relegation zone on, on Saturday. So I, I believe they've done it at the last possible moment they possibly could. To, to you know really to to save our season and um you know i i'm not i'm not happy about him losing the job but it, it needed to happen he like us like sam and sam touched on he was just out of his depth and you know there's that that you know unfortunately you know a coaching coaching it shows you now i saw a tweet today i don't know who from 
There's a Joe Edwards at Millwall and Ian Foster. Those are two young coaches who are who were highly thought of. Their coaching credentials are highly thought of. They came into um, difficult um, situations in, in terms of clubs in, in the championship. And, and it, it shows you, you know, like like you said, Joe, about like Neil Warnock coming in and being a really good man manager above all else. You know, you can be the, one of the brightest brains in, in, in the world in terms of football. But if you don't know how to manage a dressing room, it's kind of, it's all a bit pointless. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the one thing that we do have to try and, and grapple with as a fan base at the moment is there's there's two sides to this, isn't there? There's, we want the best for our football club, but equally we wanted this to to be the right decision and we have to make the right decision um, to, to keep us in, in the division. So an open forum now, you can all um, take turns because I think we, you know, the three of you have um, differing views on perhaps the strength of the arguments on this so um ian foster is out the you know that that period in argyle's chapter whilst it was brief is over we have six games left um and we have neil jewsnip director of football kevin nanskerville first team coach and simon ireland um i guess also a first team coach i don't actually know what his official title is um on duty for the rest of the season, obviously with Daryl Flahaven remaining in his, his goalkeeper role. Um, open forum, Jews Nip and Nanskerville to the end of the season. Thoughts on that and thoughts on the strategic direction we are heading in um, over the course of the next few months. I'll, um, uh, I'll allow yeah. Sam to um, focus on nothing other than supporting the players and looking forward for the next six games here. I did say after this pod has ended. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, right. Cards on the table. I I think it's an error not to go for Neil Warnock when he was very much touting himself to the club. I don't think he could have been any more blatant if he was hovering around outside outside the gates with a sign saying, pick me, could he really, as to how much he, he clearly would have had the job. Um, look, I think... Maybe there's an aspect of Neil Jusnip has gone to Simon Hallett and, and Andrew Parkinson and said, look, fellas, I got you into this mess. Let me get you out of it. Foster was my man. Let me be the one to turn it around and, and be the hero almost. And if that is the case, I, I, I admire his confidence because I think he's certainly not lacking in that. Um, I think maybe this is his redemption arc because I do think that he look. There's a lot of stuff going around about him, but I think it's probably over the top about how he's a you know dictator and all the rest of it. Look, we don't know that. What here's what we do pretty tangibly know. We do pretty tangibly know that he is in charge of recruitment strategy. We do pretty tangibly know that he was at least heavily involved in the foster hire, even if he wasn't the only one. And we do know that he was pretty heavily involved in the move to three four three all of which have had negative impacts on our season. That's before we even take into the equation rumours of a fallout with Shuey. Look, was that really what pushed Schumacher out the door? Probably not as much as the massively increased salary, if I'm honest. So, Sam, no. the, the two points, two of the three points you just raised there about um, being involved in the appointment of the new manager, or the, sorry, the, the old head coach, um, and the recruitment policy, take out the whole switch to 343, three, etc. Isn't that the job remit of a director of football at a football club to oversee well, yeah, recruitment yeah, but, policy? Yeah, and but, the... yeah ha hang on, though, Joe. I'm, I'm not saying that he shouldn't be doing those jobs. I'm saying that he's not done those jobs well because he, he's highly in Foster, who was a mistake. And I think the recruitment in January was not what we'd have hoped for. So I'm not saying that he shouldn't be doing those jobs at all. I'm saying he's not done them to a, to, to, to a great level. Now, look, is this his chance to turn things around? Maybe. But I'm I going back to what Nick said. I think somebody who has, for all the best will in the world, and completely taken aside any of the more wild speculation, someone who has had a part to play in getting us here, I'm not sure it's the best person to then get us out of it, in truth. I certainly think he gives them a better chance. I think that the performances from his four games in charge were decent and they merited more than the three points they got. I think we got unlucky at Cardiff with a fluke of an own goal. Um, you know, 
how nine nine times out of ten that that just doesn't get in that situation at all. We absolutely dominated the game, and Barley Mumba could have won it at the end. We got a bit unlucky at Southampton with that ludicrous offside call. Uh, that would have put us one the lap. Look, would we have won the game? I don't know, but I reckon we could have drawn it at least. Um, we got a bit unlucky Watford home. I think we were the better team. The only game where you could say we could got a bit lucky was the very first game, which was Birmingham. Um, and even in that, I think a draw was a fair result in the end. So I want to be and a what, bit positive. By the way, what a point that was in hindsight. I know we were all very annoyed with it at the time, but mm. Jesus Christ, if we'd lost that game, that would have had... Yeah, well, yeah, the, 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 pulling that back to 3-3, three, three yeah, and have sort of saved us a bit from being a bit cut adrift, yeah. Um, yeah, um, so look, the performances in his four games in charge were good. The results weren't, weren't quite there, but I think the performances were, you know, the, the performances merited... Uh, more than the results got. So that's the good stuff. I just think that with the, the mistakes he has made as director of football, not saying he shouldn't do those jobs, but the way in which he's executed those those jobs has left me enough to doubt him. Um, and, and, and look, whether you, whatever you think about whether he should carry on as director of football beyond this season, which is a, a separate debate, it is an almighty show of trust to give him those six games. Um, and if he, if he then does a great job and if he keeps us up, I think he, he will absolutely have, have the thanks of the fan base. Even then, th there would still probably be a conversation about whether he's the best director of football going forward. But blimey, it would be it would be a fantastic thing um, for him to keep us up and have that redemption moment. I just think even taking a side dune slip, when Neil Warnock is there in a relegation fight, he's literally the other side of the river just feels a bit mad not to get him in. Look, try to see the other point of view. He didn't do a great job at Aberdeen. We know that. Um, clearly not his not his sort of job at all. Um, he did a very good job at Huddersfield last season. He took over when they were bottom of the league and kept them up. Um, this is what he does. He takes over championship clubs in a relegation fight. And he is, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, never once relegated them. He is the ultimate, you know, consummate firefighter. And he's right there and he wants the job. That is such a brave call not to take him. Um, the, the gentleman who I think Finn was talking about with um, uh, Joe Edwards, the movie with Joe Edwards, not our Joe Edwards, and, and Ian Foster is the fantastic um, fox punter on Twitter who I have no affiliation with. He's not, I'm not getting any sponsorship money off him, but I, I love reading his threads. He's a sort of, well, psychological profiler, and he's really interested in what he writes hey, if about. I'm, if I'm not allowed to, if I'm not allowed to promote Radio Devon, you're not allowed to promote this. But, well, it, it, it's very relevant to discussion. And I think what he said is about, he said Foster's clearly an intelligent guy and a good coach, but he didn't know the first thing about the championship. And that, that um, focus on and that, that experience, those sort of things that stay in your subconscious from having done that job and been there and done it a hundred times before, do, do have great value. And experience, in a way, is always becoming undervalued. Now, look, I'm not completely saying I agree with that because I think hiring somebody inexperienced, if they had a better skill set would would be okay but I, it's hard to argue with what he said that there are jobs where you can go in without experience but it's probably you know ideally a league below and you know preferably not in the middle of a season of the relegation dog fight and i just think that you know even if you say with sit with half a season to go having a gamble like that was okay we've sort of gone from somebody who had zero games in management to someone who's had four games in management in Neil Dewsnip. So we've got, to, I guess, you know, he's been in the building as director of football for, for nearly five years now. And he has, you know, whatever you think of this season, he has done a very, very good job as director of football over those five years. But it just seems to me to be a bit self-defeating not to go for Neil Warlock. I'm interested to hear what Andrew Parkinson has to say, because no doubt he'll, he'll um, mention it and he'll give his rationale. So I'm going to hold off a little bit. And like I said, when, I, when I'm... Now that I've got this off my off my chest, I will pivot to, to full support. But I just don't see why when the, the man who is most famous for being a motivator, a firefighter, um, a survivor of relegation battles is there and wants the job, why you would A, not go for him at all, and B, why you would give it to someone whose decision-making this season has proved to be questionable. So I hope it pays off. I hope that Neil Jusnip shuts shuts me up and shuts any others up and does a fantastic job and keeps us up uh, and then move on the next season. And I think he still gives us a better chance. 
but he doesn't give us as much of a good chance as Ian, as, um, as Ian Foster, as Neil Warnock. As Neil, that was a, a slip of the tongue. Great. That gives us a much better chance than Ian Foster, but not as good as one of Neil Warnock. That's my my take on the matter. And I will now, um, I'm sure you'll be all relieved to know, shut up and I will let John and Finn say their piece. I'd just like to say a few things like on this appointment myself. I, I want to try and, you know, sort of move away from any of the sort of rumours and kind of take what Neil Drew Snip said on face value, which is in about December, just before uh, Ian Foster was um, was appointed. He was asked, could you see yourself taking this full time? And he said, basically, words to the effect of management or being on the touchline isn't for me. I prefer upstairs. Now, whether there's other reasons for this or he, he has changed his mind, ever since then, he has been on the touchline with uh, Ian Foster. And a, part of a job, I believe, of a director of football is not only to create football strategy, uh, you know, going forward and signings and, and things like that, but and dictate that. And to a certain extent, but also to give the manager some some advice. He's been on the touchline, and yes, Ian Foster hasn't had probably the correct support in terms of you know assistants coming in late and were they the right assistants and his assistants and whatever. But like in the last like seventeen games that Ian Foster's been in charge, Neil Jusnip has been on the touchline and. We haven't seen any change. I, I ultimately, the, the head coach is going to have the final say in the game, but we haven't seen any change in in, in Foster's um, um, in-game management, any change in... Just, um, uh, ben, just very quickly, just a little fact point. Um, Jusnip was back in the director's box um, conveniently this weekend. Um, oh, right. He was in the director's box at Norwich and on on uh, yesterday. I keep forgetting. The Easter weekend plays havoc what day it was. But yeah, other than that, though, your your point is right, that he spent the rest of the games on the touchline. Yeah, so he spent most of the games on the touchline after having said that he didn't like, didn't really enjoy that, that side of the game as much. And we've decided to get him in um, for, the rest of, for the rest of the season. Now, you know, forgetting who's in charge, we are just behind the team in, and and want the team to do as well as possible. And I'm sure the fans can unite on that. And the the goal this season has always been staying in the division. So as long as we achieve that, then none of this right now matters. However, Neil Warnock, whether you agreed with it in December, and I said in December, if we couldn't find a what we felt was a suit, obviously they felt. Foster was a suitable replacement in the end, but we couldn't, if we weren't confident on that, get Neil Warnock into the end of the season. Now I understand why they went for what they saw as a more long term appointment. I completely get that. But now that hasn't worked and he's still there. He's still there and he has not chosen Neil Warnock, in my opinion. Hallett, Parkinson, and Juicenip have made a big risk and potentially nailed their own coffin if we go down because they are all complicit then if we go down if we go if we if we stay up then fantastic and they can they can say they can then go away in the summer and go like this is what went wrong and we can you know sit sit down and work out what where to go next fine but they are taking a huge risk here and for me personally you know opinion now I think Neil Warnock um, nothing's going to guarantee us staying up far from it. But the guy's record at this level at doing exactly that is pretty much impeccable. So I, I personally, I'm behind the players, I'm behind G Snip, and I'm behind Nance Giville. But there is literally, there's an open goal and we haven't took it. Like we, we've tried to pass it and gone a bit wide and like, you know, it, yeah, for for me that's it really. I like for somebody we put somebody in charge that whether he meant it or not said that he didn't want to be a want to want to be a manager and now he's in charge for the possibly six of our biggest games in in recent history. John, <clears throat> yeah, I think 
I, I kind of agree. And I kind of don't. I think it's a risk for them reputationally, as Finn has identified, purely because of the narrative that Finn is selling, which I think is one that will be is and will be very common among our fan base, which is if we do go down under this management team, the narrative will be Warnock definitely would have kept us up. Um, because he's a firefighter, because he's a club legend, because he would have given the place a load of pep and whatever, not the manager pep, the sort of energy pep. Um, and and so, you know, they will, they effectively won't be able to turn around and say, well, it wasn't that straightforward, even if that is the truth. And I think it might be the truth, by the way. Like, I'm not going to sit here for one second and say that Neil Warnock definitely um, would keep us up because there is no such thing as a sure thing in football. I agree with Sam. It's the appointment I would have made instead of choosing it just because I think it maximizes the chance of staying up given his record and given his kind of power of positive thinking shtick, which seems to be kind of what we desperately need at the moment after what by all accounts has been a difficult and, and kind of divisive period. Um, but it's not a guarantee. Um, and you know, ultimately, it's probably not going to be a popular thing to say, but it's something Dan Ellard has said all season. Uh, probably we would be overachieving if we came 23rd in this league because of our budget. Now, that's definitely not me saying we should all just go down and thank, you know, thank Christ we were here at all and, um, you know, down tools and that's it. Of course, I'm not saying that. We've put ourselves in a great position. Punching above our weight is something we've done consistently for years and huge mistakes have been made that we aren't doing it this season. But I think the fact remains that we are punching above our weight. Um, and I don't think there's any guarantee that Warnock would walk in and be able to kind of turn, um, you know, turn us completely around within six games. He did an amazing job at Huddersfield. It, that is what a very big reason, you know, why I would have appointed him, because I do think that he has recently done it at this level rather than, with, you know, talking about someone like Tony Pulis, who would have been a firefighter five, six years ago. But, um, you know, I do think that at the same time, he did have a lot more time at Huddersfield, right? I believe. I think he came in in February, kind of time there, maybe March, but but certainly not later than that. So, you know, it's a difficult thing. Um, I think that the key to this question, and it's kind of a counterfactual, we're never going to know the answer to, I guess, is this is what we've been discussing. You know, this difference between Jusnip and Warnock. Uh, sorry, Jusnip and Foster in terms of style. And I think that the key question is that I don't know the answer to personally. Is what does that come down to? Because, you know, under Jewsnip, we didn't win, sure. But as Sam has alluded to, we had at least three very positive performances. We scored nine goals in four games, which I think, you know, we'd be absolutely somewhat. I don't know if I'd bite your hand off for a three-all draw at Rotherham, but I certainly would bite your hand off for a three-all draw at home to Leicester or, or maybe even at home to QPR if we win on Friday. You know, just something that shows that we're, we're going again in front of goal. Um, so, you know, it kind of looks like Jewsnip played a, a even more kind of fundamentalist version of Shuey Ball on paper. Uh, and, and obviously Foster went completely the other way. And that's ultimately what led to his sacking. So on, on that basis, you could say, well, Jusnip can revert us to that. Um, but that was the end of the Finn Azaz period at Plymouth Argyle. And, and I think the moment when Azaz just really hit his stride as being one of the best players at that time in this division, since it's probably kind of regressed at Middlesbrough to, to not looking quite as good. But I think at that moment, he was as informed as anyone else in the league, um, you know, created and uh, scored a serious number of goals for us in that kind of December period in particular. So, you know, it's possible that it was that. And if Jusnip had remained in charge on a permanent basis, you know, with what with losing him and then the faulty attacking recruitment that Nick and others have talked about today, you, you know, maybe that was just a very big factor that was going to be difficult for any manager to circumnavigate. It's also possible that the players are absolutely shattered and have just given everything this season and they're really, really tired and we have a small and young squad that doesn't quite have it in the legs. And I really hoped that wasn't the case. But like on Monday, I started to see a team that started out really, really well and then, you know, just looked so, so tired by the end. So, um, you know, it could be. And what I guess we have to hope is that that was all down to Foster that he lost the dressing room, the players weren't playing for him. Maybe maybe not they down tools in terms of effort, but there was just a huge lack of confidence and that all we need is a change to go back to something a bit more familiar, a bit more kind of ancien regime, if you will, and and, and the goals will start flowing again. You know, and, and the Jews nip to foster kind of handover indicates maybe that that might be the case. But, but I also, as I've said, I think there are reasons to think that that might not be the case, which probably puts us in a situation where it's really, really difficult for anyone to keep us up if the more kind of pessimistic things I've just said are true and that and that would include Neil Warnock but yeah to come back to my first point I ultimately agree with Finn that the narrative 
is already crystallizing among the fan base that Warnock will keep us up. He's already said he wants to. He's the kind of prince across the water getting back. And, and you know, them not doing it is a huge, huge risk because they are not going to get to turn around in the summer and make the points that I've just made and get a fair hearing for them, I don't think. And I'm not particularly sure that they would even deserve to, um, given how many things appear to have been mishandled in, in recent weeks. So, yeah, I, I think it's a really big risk. And I think, yeah, the only way to answer the question, can Warnock keep us up, is to get him in. And for me, he looks like by far the best option. Again, not a guarantee, but the best option. Yeah, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> Aaron's not going to like me, but we'll find out from Andrew Parkinson tomorrow what those reasons are. As Here's to... a question, just quickly, which I'd be interested to hear the group from. Do, do we think we're definitely not getting Warnock? I can't see them changing well, I, so well, I, I, imagine, I, I... A, imagine a scenario in which we lose the next two to Rotherham and QPR. I was not convinced that Hallett was going to sack Ian Foster and... It could be interpreted as an act of desperation, even though it came after all the other fans would have done it. But I think for Hallett, that was quite a big thing to do, given how, you know, he's all about stability and giving his man a chance and all the rest of it. And, you know, who's to say if we're one point inside the relegation zone with four games left and we just have to win them, that they don't pick up the phone if things continue to be awful for the next two. I'm just, I'm not saying it's possible. I'm not saying it's probable. I'm just saying it's, it could happen. It wouldn't shock me, John. Um, nothing would really shock me the way this season's gone. I think it's been an absolutely bonkers Seeds. I don't think we've had one quite like it in terms of all the twists and turns. Um, look, let's just hope it has a happy ending. It wouldn't shock me. I must admit, I, I literally, I wasn't going to mention it on, on my ground to staying positive, but since you literally asked me that direct question, I absolutely did think if we if we lose on Friday at Rotherham, Saturday is going to be all over. Get Warnock in for the for the QPR game. It will be. Obviously, I please God hope we don't lose at Rotherham. That would be very embarrassing, certainly not least on Sky TV. But it wouldn't stun me. Let's just hope we get at least four points out of these next two so that it's not going to be needed. And then if we get the four points, we're more than halfway there to survival, most likely. But would it shock me if if we did still see him in that dugout for the final five games or four games or even final three games? No. No, it wouldn't. I, I, I would like to say, like, I think... I, I would like to hope that they genuinely think, for whatever reason, uh, whether they even think that Neil Warnock is not the guy anymore and they don't want to appoint him, I, gen I would genuinely like to hope that they think that Neil Dewsnip and Kevin Lanskerville are the best chance of us staying in this division. Like, I genuinely hope that that's the reason they've they picked them rather than rather than it being okay. We just need a little bit of continuity, so we're not even going to bother. You know, I genuinely hope that they, because obviously they see them more on a day to day basis than we do. And you can believe the rumours about Juice Nip as much as you want or not, but ultimately, you know, we're not in the dressing room, so we don't know. So I genuinely, genuinely hope that they believe whether they're right or not. We'll see. But they, the reason that they've appointed them is because they think that those two are the people to keep us up. Um, I'm just going to give one last bit of free advertising. Um, don't worry, Aaron, it's not for, a, <laughs> excuse me, maybe it's for a Rennies or a Strepsils or something. Um, it's not for a, a, another radio show or something. It's actually for Sam Barker on Twitter um, because there's been a lot of vitriol going around on social media over the last 24 hours since the statement was put out. And it was, my voice is going, Aaron, you might be needed here. Um, since it was uh, put out, that Neil Jusnip and Kevin Nancy were going to take charge at the end of the season. Um, and there's been a lot said about Neil Jusnip um, on the various social medias and forums and things. And we've had our disagreements today in, in our group chats about it. And, and that's fine. Football's based on opinions. But I just want to read Sam Barker's tweet out. Um, I was as anti-Foster as they come and I can't quite wrap my head. I can't wrap my head around, sorry, not getting Warnock in. But he then goes on to say, and I think this is a really important point, but there is a time and a place for questioning Jewsnip. This ain't it. Park it for five weeks. And I think that's the big point here. We can all have our opinion. I just want to sort of move it away now from the Jewsnip Nancy Will Warnock debate because we got a load of questions in the in the comments that I still want to rattle through. But I think that's a really important point that, you know, whilst I said my bit on Warnock, you guys have said your bit, all the other panellists tonight have said very eloquent arguments and sales for and against um, who should be in charge, who shouldn't. We need to park everything now for five weeks and just get on with with getting behind Jews, Nip, Nance, Grio, Edwards and the team. Because if we create an atmosphere like we had yesterday, 
for the next three home games. Home Park isn't going to be an easy place to come, even if you're Leicester City, because um, Home Park really did, although I agree with Chris that there was a weird feeling around Home Park yesterday, in the stands, it was very positive right up until that last minute. We They were trying everything to get behind the group, and I think that's what we need to focus on. But we have neglected the um, comments in the questions far too much now. I'm going to blame Aaron for that, um, because he's been hosting longer than I have tonight. Um, so let's quickly rattle through the ones that haven't um, been asked yet. Um, let's have a look. Do, do, do a couple of there were for Chris Errington. We can't do them now. Um, what have we got? Argyle Till I Die um, sent a question in saying, why was he not sacked after that shambolic Sheffield Wednesday Blackburn week? Absolutely no way was one point acceptable. Um, we'll try and keep these answers brief if we can, lads, because we have been on for nearly three hours now already, and we um, we probably do need to let people get some sleep, and I've got an 11-hour shift tomorrow, so I'd like to get some sleep. Um, so we'll quickly rattle through as many as we can. Sam, you can take this one. Why was he not sacked after Wednesday Blackburn? That's a question they have to answer, isn't it? Well, it is. Um, I must admit, I actually wouldn't have sacked him in that week. My tipping point was the Preston game. Um Look, I think Wednesday the Blackburn was a very short turnaround and I think they were possibly staying up north or meant to be staying up north. So I get not doing it after Wednesday. And obviously Simon Hallett did say in his statement, we have to never to make it work. So I get that. Look, after Blackburn, that's a more suitable time to do it with a whole week before the game. But it was a much improved performance at Blackburn. Probably the second best performance of the Foster era after Middlesbrough, uh, maybe Cardiff home. But it was a much improved performance, and I get why they would have thought given one more game. So I, I get not doing it after that week. The time that he absolutely should have been done was after Preston going into the international break. That for me is when it's baffling they didn't do it after the Wednesday Blackburn week. I kind of get why they didn't. Um, John, this one for you from Marcus Ham on X, Twitter, whatever Elon wants us to call it nowadays. Have Argyle lost its appeal to whomever, whomever the next manager could be, even if we do stay up? Uh, no, because there's only 92 jobs in the Football League, 24 jobs in the Championship. You know, it's a bit like seats in F1, right? Like there are still loads and loads and loads of good drivers who are going to want to drive for um kick salva or whatever that team's called now even if they're an absolute joke you know because because there's there's a scarcity of positions and and loads and loads of people want to be a manager in the not, not only in the football league in this country in the championship which i think is absolutely one of the most exciting leagues in the world um you know are we going to be able to get in a really big name manager who could be managing at the top end of this division? No, but then that was also the case when we hired Foster. I don't think we were going to be competitive for luring, you know, Daniel Farker or, or Russell Martin or whoever away from their, their jobs with top teams at this level, because that's not how it works. So, um, you know, I still think it's, I still think it's going to be a really, really attractive proposition for, you know, whoever might get the opportunities come in in the summer. And, and I think it arguably you know, it doesn't really matter if we stay up or go down from that individual point of view, because I think it will be an attractive job in League One, um, arguably maybe more so than, the, than in the championship for a certain type of manager. There might be a certain type of manager who looks at us in the championship and thinks low budget, struggle towards the end of last season, probably going to be a rebuild job, losing Whitaker, maybe some other big players. You know, that's that's going to be really tough. You know, a certain type of manager might look at us going down to League One and think, well, this team pissed this division uh, two seasons ago. Um, you know, we've got loads more money coming in now from those sales. It's going to be a reset. I, I really back back myself to take them up. So, you know, the, the sort of tier of manager who I think we were likely to be attractive to in January is probably going to be about the same as the tier we're attractive to now. And obviously the problem was in January we appointed the wrong person. Um, but, you know, the, the likes of Michael Duff, for example, I could absolutely still uh, still see wanting to take this job in the summer. Obviously, we're going to have a, a debate nearer the time as to whether that's a, an appropriate name or not. I know Joe is very enthusiastic about him. Uh, I am fairly enthusiastic about him as a, as a potential option. But, you know, it's, it's no guarantee that any one individual wants to take the job because there are obviously personal circumstances, you know, to do with moving and and you know all the rest of it that just comes with taking any job but like in terms of the football side of it i still think we're a generally upwardly mobile club still think we have a reputation for being well run we're not in dire financial straits you know we're not failing to pay the players that kind of thing and yeah once again there's it, it a scarcity of positions in professional football so 
you know, I, I'm, I'm not really, I'm worried about the appointment in the summer from a point of view of us getting it wrong again, potentially, uh, like we did in January. I'm not, I'm not worried about the, the caliber of applicant that we might be able to, to attract personally. And one for you, FPL is life. As this has become so obvious that we've stopped saying it, but why were the board hiring a defensive specialist coach when they explicitly wanted an attacking intent? Yeah, I think that's the question they got an they got an answer because that was one that I think that's the thing that stuck out for me. It's like if we didn't have that statement from Simon Hallett saying, "Well, we want to play vertical football, we want to be an attack minded side," I think the change in approach wouldn't have been so apparent because that was certainly implanted in my mind that that was what we were trying to do. So so either, so this is what I said a couple of weeks ago before you were saying, either they've been played, we've been lied to, or uh by 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 Ian by Ian Foster and they've been lied to in the in the in the in the Brooks well, in the in in his interview, sorry. Or it's just been a miscommunication of, of, of some sort. And that's the third thing is probably likely, but I think uh yeah, I, I, I don't really I don't really know. And to call him a defensive specialist coach, I don't know you could even say that because we had two clean sheets in his entire <laughs> in his entire tenure. So whilst he um did um make um some defensive improvements um in our team, I think I think you could tangibly see that. Um I don't think our defensive defense is good enough anyway um at this level generally. So so I think uh, yeah, I, I don't really know the question uh, the answer to that question. And I think that's probably gonna be a well, whether it comes to Andrew Parkinson in that um in that in that way tomorrow. I, I think that's one that they're going to have to answer. Like, what? How, how did you get this so wrong? And and they're probably still work, working that out themselves, to be honest with you. So, my um my own gut feeling is the next the next fans forum, regardless of whatever happens over the course of the next six games, the next fans forum could be quite an interesting watch. Um, and I'd highly recommend that people get down to it um or watch it online um just in case you're wondering if you why your question hasn't been read out we've had a lot tonight all on the same sort of theme um and i'm sort of a little bit there's the quest the obvious question that and we've got quite a few of them in the comments here about um you know who do we want as the next manager what sort of stuff what sort of type of manager do we want and i sort of feel like at the moment that's probably the least pressing question at the moment we will address that in a in a live stream later on once we know what division we're in, we'll come back on and we'll, we'll have a big a big chat about that. But that's probably why I've not read it out. There's another question there from Marcus saying, why isn't Jusnip taking any responsibility? It wasn't just Anna Foster. Um, I would guess there's going to be a pre-match press conference tomorrow before Rotherham. And I trust that Chris Errington, Ross Reed, Alan Richardson, James Vickery, whoever it is that's going to go along for the media, um, might ask that themselves. So... Um, we'll have to keep an eye out for that. But of course, we do have the small matter of just six games coming up. And the very next one is Rotherham and Open Forum, lads. I know um, the title is Ian Foster sacked, but we do sort of have to do the day job a little bit with this. Um, Lewin Reed asked the question much, much earlier um, in the evening. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously get all three of your thoughts. What's the realistic starting 11s here? What do we expect? Or do we expect any wholesale changes? You know, we'll be suddenly expecting everything to be ripped up and go back to a certain style. Or, you know, has somebody had a brainwave over the last 48 hours? What are we, what are we thinking team-wise um, ahead of our date with national te national um, pay-per-view television? Um, I think that 4 3, three is certainly in play. Um, for all the fact that Monday was the final nail in the coffin, the first half hour we did play okay. And I think having 4-3-3 three, three allowed us to dominate possession more than we otherwise might have. And obviously I've not really given my thoughts on Monday as a game. I know it's kind of yesterday's news now with all the other stuff, but um, I do think there were some positives to take from the shape, if not the execution on Monday. Um so I think I probably would stick with 4 3, three. The only point against 4 3, three is that with JB injured, um, Divine suspended for being an idiot, 
um, we are probably running out of midfielders um, to play 4-3-3, unless you go for Forshaw, Houghton and Randall as a trio. But that's maybe a bit too defensive. Um, unless you want to be very brave and put Callum Wright back in, um, you know, in the spirit of uh, reconciliation and, and togetherness, maybe put Callum Wright back in. Um or, or yeah, no, I, I no, no, no one else can even play unless you're going to put young Caleb Roberts in, and I think that would be a you know far too much of a baptism of fire. Um, so yeah, um, it could be four three three. It could be. I think I think my gut says it will be three four three because that was always Hugh Slip's thing to start with. So I, my gut probably says to me, Pleggy, Gibson, Galloway. I think Ashley Phillips will be rested for a few games. I think he's had a poor run of form. Uh, truth be told. So I think it will be Pleggy, Gibson, Galloway. Um, I think we'll see Sorinola. I think we'll see which of the three will miss out. I think Forshaw's not been great lately. I think we'll see Houghton and Randall. Um, could be wrong. I think we'll see Houghton and Randall with Forshaw on the bench. I think we'll see Mumba left wing back finally in his best position, which we've not really seen all season. Um, and I think we'll see Whitaker, Hardy, and well, with Divine suspended, I guess that leaves Bundu, doesn't it? So I think we'll see Whitaker, Hardy, Bundu, and I think it'll be three four three in that shape. Oh, and uh, Cooper in goal, obviously. I would I would just make one change to that in terms of what I expect to happen. Um, I think Mumba will be in place of where you had Bundu and Mikel Miller at left wing back against his former and also namesake club. I yeah no I kind of forgot about that him actually yeah I, yeah yeah I think you could be right and then it will be yeah because Mumba in the but then Mumba in the front three of a four, of a three four three that's something that we've seen Mumba in the front three of a four three three but we've not seen them in in the front three of a of a three four three that's a lot of talking there um <laughs> put my teeth into that um yeah um well, it could be but I don't know I think if you're playing three four three you've got to as much as Miller has had. Some good games this season. I think he was good at Norwich on Friday. I do not think he's good off the bench against Bristol City. I think you've got to finally just give Mumba a go in his best position. You could well be right in what I would expect to happen, but I would prefer Mumba. Finn, any advance on what the two lads have said team-wise for Friday? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of what I actually expect to happen, I'm pretty much going to go with what the other two guys have said. But I, I'd like to, to see the way I'm viewing... Friday is it's as close. I know it's get points in the championship, but it's as close as a League One match as we're going to get. Like Rotherham are not good. Like I think, put Dan Scar in for this game. Put Callum Wright in for this game with a point to prove against a weaker opposition. Where I think Rotherham's only threat to us is have they still got Tom Eaves? And does he play? Yeah. But like Tom, Tom Eaves, like in the air, is a, is a threat. We know that Dan Scar is very good in the air. I don't believe that the rest of like Rotherham's team is, is is very good. So I believe that Dan Scar's weaknesses in that game won't be shown up as, as much as it might be in others. And they've got massive points to prove. The manager that they supposedly f have fallen out with, if you believe rumours, is gone. Um and and I think I think I'd put those two in and, and see what they can do, especially given that like you know, we've all been calling for Bundu and stuff, but Foster didn't particularly uh didn't didn't particularly take to him and, and he to be honest, the, the limited time that he has on on the pitch, he hasn't he hasn't done loads. So I, I think I would go for those two. Whether I expect to see them is another thing, but that's the only thing I'd say on that. Um I think I think producer Aaron's gone gone to sleep i think it's past his bedtime so i'll do the i'll do the comments for him um there's quite a few coming through now there he goes he's awake look um you just have to you know he's you just have to give him a little jab every now and again just to, just to wake him up um so rounding off then he's obviously going to bring through the viewers uh ideas for team um and, and formations and shapes um one of ian foster's non-negotiables in the press conferences lads was the next game is always the biggest game of the season um this one certainly is how do we see it going 
We're on, to use another Ian Foster, and we're on match day minus three at the moment uh, <laughs> going into this game. Um, and we are all going to have to suffer. Um, <laughs> Um, some, I think some of us listen, 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 we're excited Sam, about some it. Of us been, some of us have been on since seven thirty. Some of us are already suffering. I think we'll win. Um, don't ask me if we'll stay up. I'm not so certain on that, but I do think we'll get a win on Friday. And if we do, John. we're maybe nearly halfway there. I think we'll win two one uh, goals from. Okay. Mumba. You're going to give us the minute as well. If you know, goals from <laughs> Mumba and. Hardy, Hardy's going to break his duck and get back to scoring form. Mumber and Hardy. John? Uh, if we win, we're halfway there. Whoa, Sam, don't get a chair. Uh, no, that's good. <laughs> um, Parker to be clipped, added. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, just to be contrarian, uh, and also because I kind of partially believe it, I think we'll draw on Friday. It'll be really frustrating just the sort of game where we're not really kind of yeah well i think we'll be very up for it i don't think that's necessarily been the issue going into games but just one where things maybe don't go our way a couple of reasons i think that number one is that um you know Jews nips first game in charge after shuey went when there was a lot of destabilization around that was that draw against birmingham who also you know are kind of down there and we weren't really great, but then we did pick up in the other games under him. It, that, for that first one was a bit of a learning curve, and yeah, I could see similar here. Also, let you know, lest lest we forget, we were very lucky to get three. Well, I say lucky, it was it was quality, but you know, a bit lucky to get three points in the home game against Rotherham under Schumacher, which was his final game in charge. Even though at the time they were arguably even more abject than they are now, um, because I think they're the sort of side that maybe are preferred style doesn't really work so well against tried to kill half our team as well that day didn't they yeah well, yeah well exactly and that so i could see us drawing on friday a lot of doom and gloom around it but then we stay up i i think we have a lot more winnable games than than some people in the comments and, and on here seem to think i think rotherham qpr um stoke and millwall are all super winnable games and the two home games against leicester and hull are obviously a very much kind of depends which version of those two sides show up. Obviously, if their if their quality um, all come out to play on those particular days, we will lose those games because they have unbelievably good players both both of those sides. But um, I think those other four games out of six are absolutely winnable. So I don't think it's the end of the world if we don't win on Friday. But obviously, it would be bloody nice. Ben, quickly. Yeah. Uh... I'm going to go more with Sam. I don't think it's going to be a particularly vintage performance and we might come away thinking, oh, how are we going to do, uh, you know, for the rest of these games? Uh, uh, but I think the three points is the most important thing. Like, we must get three points on the, on 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 Friday, I believe. So I'm going to go scrappy 2-1, uh, maybe a bit more nervy than we'd like. And yes, um, we'll get those three points and then... I, I I think we can get uh, I think we can get four points, not easily, but I think we can get four points pretty capably over the over the next two games. Six out of six is a bit more of an ask, but we can definitely do that as well. So, John, um, just to pick up on your point that you made about um, you made it earlier about Birmingham and how that game went and what you said about this game. My gut feeling about that Birmingham performance was there was such a buzz leading into it that the players were almost too fired up and ready for it and perhaps too much wanted to prove a point. And maybe that did right. lead to the the three one scoreline at one point that day. Um and I just I hope that's not the case in this game. I hope that we're a little bit more um level headed going into Friday and we just approach it as as the next game. Um Sam um you asked me not to um so are we gonna stay up? And yes, I do want an answer because we've got an answer off everybody else on the podcast tonight. So I want an answer. No, one point, Clip. final day. Clipped. That's on TikTok tomorrow. But Everyone I said we wouldn't go up that. last season. I said we wouldn't go up last season. So I'm hopefully going to have the same outcome. Look, I think it'll be close. Sam, Sam didn't say we were going up last season until Callum Wright put the goal in against Shrewsbury. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Uh, look. Look, I think it'll be very tight. I think we absolutely can do it. I think it will be on the knife edge. I absolutely think it will go to the final day. I please, I please don't interpret this as me saying we're doomed. We may as well give up. But if you're asking me for my gutest of gut feelings, do we do it right now? 
I am just just inclining against and I hope I'm really really hope I'm wrong just before I um go on to the closer just to check with you two you both said we're fine didn't you um no I can't remember yeah. Can't remember what I said to be honest. I don't. I don't think we're fine. I think on on balance, I was, I was sort of saying I think we'll draw at Rotherham and stay up to counter Sam's. We'll win at Rotherham and go down. Uh, opinion. I think I do on on balance think that. Uh, honest, but honestly, like any outcome from we get zero points between now and the end of the season and just go down without a fight, or we win four out of six. It turns out Foster was the problem and, you know, pretty much the entire problem. And, and we just go back to our free scoring ways against a selection of quite rubbish teams, frankly, is possible. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it has to go down to the final day at all. We've got, you know, six games is quite a lot of games and quite a lot of them are winnable. So I think we could very easily find ourselves four or five points clear of it within three or four games. I really, really do. But yeah, um, obviously it could go to the final day. Um I, I don't know if I would have agreed with Chris Errington's take that we'll all take it to go down to the final day, which he said earlier. I think I'd much rather it was done before having to face a whole side with unbelievable Premier League quality in their team at a nervy home park. So hopefully let's, you know what, Aaron, uh, um, Aaron, Joe, let's get it done at Stoke. How about that? Let's aim yeah, for exactly. that. That'd be nice. Wouldn't it? Yeah, the, the Neil Jewsnip versus Stephen Schumacher dust up at the Britannia Bet 365, whatever it's bloody called nowadays, the Oat Cake Arena. Um, Let's be fair, that's, you know, Chris is talking probably with his journalism hat on a little bit and he will, uh, I'm sure he'll do a very good job of, as he does every week on um, covering Argyle and it would be a great thing, um, you know, from a journalist point of view, a last day decider is always a, a good thing. Um, I'm conscious that we've been on now for three hours, 10 minutes and 42 seconds. Um, we have this, we've had some great guests on with us this evening. Um, massive thanks to... I'm going to get this wrong now, but massive thanks to Adam, to Ben, to Graham, to Nick, to James from One Team in Devon, to Chris Arrington, who was great. And we hope to have Chris on again in the future. More on that um, in the future. To Finn, to John, to Sam, to Aaron, who's now backstage producing um, from myself. Just a quick word before and we go any further. Joe. Joe as well, yeah, thanks say. to you, Joe, as well. Sterling effort. As you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, coming soon, sign up, 10% off, sign up to the mailing list. The details are on the screen right now. We do have some Argo Life merchandise coming out before. If you haven't already, what have you been doing for the last three hours and 11 minutes? Why have you not subscribed to Argo Life on YouTube, followed us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, whatever it is you need to do? and share the word um and i speak on behalf of everyone to do with the green and white podcast 2990 of you was the peak this evening um we are incredibly grateful to all the support all the comments all the views all the shares all the likes all the retweets whatever it is um we are incredibly grateful of course when things don't go our way as podcast when things don't go the way of the club in a positive manner as podcasters it always makes it a little bit easier for us to talk um although we did enjoy talking about our unbelievable season last year um but that is all we've kept you for long enough um we've all got work thank you for all the comments thank you for the support keep the faith as guy says we've got six massive games to go we have to get behind neil jewsnip kevin nance joe edwards the whole team the whole club we have six enormous games to go um, we won't be back this week before Rotherham. We've done our Rotherham preview here tonight. We will be back on Saturday night. Hopefully my voice will have recovered by then um, or I'll just get a couple of pints of water next to me and I'll be able to get through it. Um, I believe the People's Champion Sam is joining us with a couple others as well. Um, and then we back. Um, there is potentially a plan for another um, space post-game as well. More on that um, on the day on Saturday. But Friday night even late Friday night there you go Aaron's Aaron's hot on it but thank you all for the support thank you for watching this has been the green and white podcast brought to you by Argo Life get behind the boys one last push one last dance you could almost say maybe not for Warnock but certainly for Jewsnip night all